If you like the video make sure to like, subscribe, and comment. For more videos like this, outdoor enthusiasts, hikers, and campers. What are your true scary and strange encounters out there in the deep woods, trails, and forests? 17 years ago, my two brothers, D8 years old and S2 years old, were with my mom at a camp of some sort in the woods. My mom was talking to her friends around the campfire. D was playing with S when S seemed almost mesmerized by something in the bushes in the distance. He paid no attention to anything but that bush. He kept walking into the bushes, and D had to forcefully bring him back to the camp. D started crying when he came back to my mom, telling her to watch S very closely. She asked why he was crying, and he said, short and scary old men kept trying to take him into the bushes. My mom finished comforting D when S was gone. They found him much later, still walking in one direction inside the bushes. I still get chills thinking of what could have happened if they didn't find my brother. I started my adventure this year by biking the Arizona Trail. I was riding an Amtrak to get to Oz and met a Navajo man in the viewing car. He was in his mid-thirties and day drunk. He said he was headed back to his reservation for a few weeks and hadn't seen his kids in five years. He told me about his life on the reservation. Fascinating. Anyway, I told him I'd be hiking through New Mexico on the Continental Divide Trail later that year, and he became adamant that I should know how to protect myself against skinwalkers. He said that he'd seen one when he was hunting as a teenager with his cousins. He said he watched a huge jackrabbit, whose head was waist high, walk behind a tree about 150 yards away, and from the other side of the tree came a humanoid with a tail. He was visibly nervous when relating this story. He said skinwalkers live on the reservation lands, usually in caves and gulches and other bad lands where people don't like to go. I took this to mean difficult terrain. I asked him what they were, and he said they were very evil medicine men. He said to never be alone out there. He said the skinwalkers will try to influence your thoughts and emotions. I.e., make you have bad thoughts and want to hurt yourself or others. They'll make you depressed and suicidal, according to him. They'll also try to lower you off track. He said never ever follow one. They'll try to get you away from your group and lost in the wilderness. Now this is really interesting to me because, again, it's the element of choice, and it seems like they don't just grab you, you have to go to them. He said if I saw one, I could identify it by the fact that it would look like an animal, but that was not quite right. It'll have some characteristic that is off, like a rabbit with human feet or eyes. Again, very interesting, and it makes me think of the men in black scenario, where they look almost human but are just off a little bit and not quite right. He said the only way to kill one was to coat arrowheads or bullets in the ash of, I think, an ash tree, but I'm not sure what type of tree he said. Also, if you saw one, rub yourself down in the ashes of that same tree, and that would protect you. I don't think the guy was trying to screw with me. He seemed very genuine and genuinely shaken when he was telling me this stuff. I think it's really interesting how all these native cultures have stories about entities in the wild that will try to take you in some fashion. It can't all be myths. The CDT goes through a lot of reservation land in NM, so I'll keep my eyes peeled for high strangeness. My grandfather owned a cabin. I'm not disclosing the location of it due to the fact that I don't want anything to happen to anyone. Anyway, my grandfather's cabin was his way of getting the family together for the holidays, so he could have a nice Sunday dinner with all of us. One day, all of a sudden, that all stopped abruptly. He wouldn't allow anyone but himself to visit the cabin we all looked forward to going to and cherishing. For years, I would ask him why he was doing that. He never told me why, but when he passed, he left the place for me. I inherited the cabin from my childhood and was ecstatic about that. It was soon after that that I realized why he did what he did. I would go out and walk the woods on game trails, which are everywhere. I know these woods like I know my own home, so I never had any reason to fear them. It was on one of these walks that I encountered what people call dogmen. I was walking, just like any other time. Nothing was different. It was then, on one of the game trails, that I noticed an offshoot, small trail that went only six to seven feet back. I could see that something had bedded down there. I thought it was a deer. I then walked into the bed area. I soon realized that this was an ambush point for whatever made this bedded area, and it was massive. My arm hair stood erect, and a chill literally ran down my spine. I felt as if I was being watched from different vantage points. Since it was nighttime, I had a tracking flashlight in my sidearm. The latter of which I drew and kept at the ready. I genuinely feared for my life at this point. All of a sudden, an ungodly growl was made to my right, about 10 to 15 yards from me, very close indeed. I pissed myself. It was so terrifying. I didn't immediately run, 
fearing that whatever it was might take me as threatening. I turned and started heading back on the main trail, and when I was about five minutes from the back door of my cabin, this thing let out a howl that I swear felt like it went right through my body. I then proceeded to run. As soon as I did, this thing was chasing me. For every five steps I took, this thing was taking one. That's how fast this dogman was. I heard the sounds of branches being ripped off trees, and I could have sworn I felt the vibrations of them running after me. I barely made it to my cabin and slammed the door, locking the two dead bolts and chain lock. I then turned on my spotlight and shined it into the tree line. There were three sets of eyes in the tree line that shone vivid yellow with enormous, black pupils. I felt as if the thing could read my mind, but I'm not sure it could. All I know is that I'm alive and have since heard them many times, but I don't take night hikes anymore and haven't for years. I grew up in the Adirondacks, near Whitehall, New York. My grandmother lived in the middle of the woods, and every weekend, I would be dropped off to be watched by her while my mother worked along with an assortment of up to 10 other cousins. One weekend when I was seven was the rare exception, as I was the only grandchild there. The woods behind her house were incredibly dense, but not particularly scary. There was a four-wheeler trail about a mile and that my cousins and I would frequently play on, and we had carved out our own trail to get there. I'd gone so many times that I knew the way like the back of my hand. Growing up in the woods can make you fearless, so even at a young age, I dared venture into the woods day and night without a second thought. Still, my grandmother forbade entering the woods without my older cousins, and normally I obeyed. One thing we know for certain is that I entered the woods sometime early in the morning on Sunday before my grandmother awoke and did not come home until that evening, long after my mother had been called. I was shaken, pale, hysterical, and would not speak. The fearlessness that had been instilled in me from such a young age was gone, utterly destroyed. I would no longer leave my grandmother's house, even with other people. In fact, I would no longer leave my own home, and I was diagnosed with agoraphobia at age 9, a condition I still deal with to this day. No one knows what happened, and I can't remember that entire weekend. My mother took me to the hospital, and I was fine, aside from being dehydrated and in shock. When I tell this story, I often get met with, oh, you must have stumbled across a bear. Except we only have black bears here, which are practically frightened teddy bears that you can easily scare away by yelling. There were many hunting nests in the forest, and I knew to go to one of them and yell from the top of it until the bear went away. They were truly a non-issue. However, anyone who has ever heard of Whitehall, New York, knows that it is one of the most active Bigfoot towns in the world. In fact, just this month, they voted to have Bigfoot declared the official town animal. We will never know what happened, and honestly, I don't think I want to. Years ago, my wife and I went camping in the Bankhead National Forest in Alabama. The site was fairly remote. A beautiful waterfall that was known as a sacred space. I didn't see anyone else the whole time we were there. But we did see some old pieces of an old sweat lodge and a few burnt out smudge sticks on the rock bluffs, so we knew folks had been there within the past few weeks. We had a great time swimming in the creek, setting up camp, and eating a great dinner. The falls were only 30 yards away. So they were loud enough that we'd have to speak up a bit to hear each other. I woke up about 2 a.m., thinking I was still dreaming. The falls sounded like drums, and I thought I could almost make out chanting. I'm like, WTF? Are we being pranked? After a few minutes, I'm fully awake. The drums are loud. Boom, 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 boom. I wake up my wife and ask her if she hears drums. Yes, what is that? The sounds are freaky enough to get her fully awake in just a few seconds. I grab the flashlight and walk around outside the tent. Boom, 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 boom. The loud drumming continues. But there is nothing around. We both get back in the tent, pretty freaked out. We're both awake for maybe another hour, with the loud booming going on, before we both fall back to sleep. In the morning and the next day, we just heard the falls. But we packed up and got the hell out of there. A buddy and I were camping in the backwoods of the Idaho mountains, pretty far from everyone in the middle of the week, the nearest town is like 600 people an hour away. We got camp set up around 7, and we got a fire going to cook hot dogs. We're just chilling around the fire, and when it gets dark, we're snacking on things like Cheetos and stuff. We could hear cracking up the mountain as we talked. Like stepping on bushes and stuff. We stop talking, and the noises stop. We're a little unnerved, but we brought guns to go shooting the next day, and we've got a pretty big fire going, so we start talking again. The rustling gets closer, like something or someone is moving down the mountain. We stop talking, and the noises stop again. This happens like twice more. We talk, something or someone moves closer. 
We stop, and the noises stop. Finally, when whatever or whoever it was was like 200 feet away in the dark, I grabbed my rifle out of the truck and put a shot into the air. Whatever it was hauls ass up the mountainside in pitch black. Like, we're talking about 400 feet in 30 seconds. I don't think it was like an elk, bear, or cattle, it was super eerie. It knew to stop when we stopped talking. But I don't think it could have been a person, it moved way too quickly up the hill in dense brush in pitch black. We've not gone back there since. Around 10 years ago, I went on a short hike in the Green Mountain National Forest in Vermont, around the base of Mount Glastonbury. It was just a short day of hiking. I planned to find the old railroad bed and check out the remains of the old ghost town there from the 19th century. I had gone before with a group of people, and it was a beautiful hike with water that culminated with a great view of the area from an old fire tower. Thankfully, I was not completely alone and had brought my dog, BB, a three-year-old Rottweiler. She was good company for a trip like this, and I was glad to have her along. I parked on an old logging road and found the path to the trail that would take me to the abandoned railroad bed that is now buried deep in the woods. I was a mile or two in and almost to the railroad bed when I heard something. It was whistling, the kind someone would use to call a dog. Instantly, Bibi looked up and tried to bolt to the right of the trail, where the sound was coming from. Luckily, I had a good hold on her leash and stopped her from running off. She barked in the direction of the whistling, but I got her to sit, and the whistling stopped. I had a strange feeling, even though I could not see who was whistling, it felt like it was directed towards Bibi, and someone had tried to separate me from her. I was not sure what to do, but after a minute or two of no more sounds, I dismissed it as a coincidence and continued on our walk. Not ten steps later, I heard a woman's voice from the other side of the trail. Hello? Come here. We are just off the trail. Then I heard what sounded like the playful laughter of another woman. The tone of the calls was playful, almost seductive. Hello, come down here, what's your name? I was curious and even a little intrigued to check it out, the voice was very pleasant, but after a split second, I stopped myself from moving. Looking to the left, where the voices were coming from, I could almost see a path through the trees, down the ridge, a perfectly straight line. There was no noise, not even the rustling of leaves or the chirping of birds. I started to feel lightheaded and confused. Bibi barked again, and I snapped out of it. A feeling of complete dread then overtook me. I reached into my pocket, pulled the Ruger LC9 I had in a pocket holster out, held the pistol to my side, and clicked the safety off. As soon as I did that, I began to hear things again, the rustling sounds of birds tweeting. Looking to the left again, the path that had just been there was gone. After that, I decided to end my hike, and we booked it back to the car without incident. The strangest thing was yet to come. When I got back to my car and drove off the mountain and had cell phone service again, my phone was blown up with missed messages from my girlfriend and brother asking where I was and why I was not back yet. I checked the time on my phone, and it was 4 p.m. I had started my hike around 8 a.m. I'd been gone for 8 hours and could only account for a couple of hours of the time. To this day, I have no explanation of what happened. I don't hike anymore either, and I took up golf. It was 2015, and I had gone camping with three friends. This was like the third time camping ever, and we were at a pay-to-stay campground. We were even staying in a tiny cabin by a big lake. So it wasn't out in the wild. Back then, I used to get panic attacks, sometimes for no reason. And for some reason, despite my immense love for nature, ever since my first camping trip, I would often get a panic attack when camping. I'd cry. Well, that night I had one, and it was pretty severe, to the point where I'd feel like I couldn't breathe if I stayed in the cabin but I would get scared if I stayed outside. So I had a lot of back and forth, and my poor friends put up with me. At one point, I had stepped outside with one of them, my so at the time, and was trying to calm down while also wondering where to pee. My so had a flashlight and was leading me to a spot in the dirt at the edge of the trees between our two parked cars. He reasoned it was a good distance from the cabin and yet not in the middle of the woods where some critter could catch me with my pants down. So I agreed. That's when I saw it. I can still remember. I stepped past the first car and looked between the cars toward the edge of the woods. Between the candles at the cabin and the flashlight, nearby but not directly upon the spot where I saw this, I saw something. A creature. It was so strange because it was silent. The creature had the general body shape of a dog, but its colors and features were more like those of a hyena. Kind of gray and dark splotches. It stood perfectly still, peeking out behind the front of the car, so I only saw its torso, head, and front legs. The thing I'll never get over is its face. It looked like it was frozen in time, with its jaw wide open and revealing sharp, bright teeth. 
its eyes were looking right at me. But its nose wasn't wrinkled like a snarl, and there was no growling or sound. It was the oddest thing. And it sent an instant, deep ball of dread down into my core. After I froze for a long moment, I grabbed my so's arm, urgently whispered for him to go back to the cabin, and pulled him back. We got into the cabin. The other two friends were asleep. My so didn't see it at all, I don't think. I'll ask him. I couldn't sleep that night. There was a guy who was working on my house on a regular basis. I got to know him well. He was a roughneck and always had been. While working one day in the basement near the archives, he noticed all the books on odd subjects. He wasn't much interested in UFOs, but he picked books on Bigfoot off the shelf. He wanted to read some of this, but what he really wanted to do was tell me about his younger life in Oregon. He had grown up in the area of Sweet Home, Oregon. I don't know if his father was employed by the lumber companies, but that's likely, they used to take hiking and camping trips into the mountain woods. When my worker was grown and on his own, he and his brother continued this. So when they went, his brother would go one way, towards the pot, and he'd go another. As these outings proceeded, he felt that there were regular signs of the presence of Bigfoot and that he had even seen one at a distance. Then came the close encounter. He had prepared the camp in an honorary way with a recumbent dreamcatcher at the campground table and left a portion of food behind. When he returned, the food was gone, no real mystery, but there in its place was an eagle feather. Native American cultures consider the eagle feather a sign of honoring the recipient as a person due respect. My worker didn't know that, but he wondered if the gift giver was thanking him for respecting the woods. Suddenly there, not far away, was the creature himself. A classic Bigfoot. He thought that he was being communicated to somehow, and the respect was mutual. Still, even with this, my worker, a tough guy male, still held on to the idea that this was some kind of human-like biological creature. So I asked him, how did this meeting end? He replied that the creature just turned away and vanished. I asked, vanished? Or just walk away? He said, well, he just seemed to vanish. I looked at him silently for a few seconds. Vanished? Does that sound like anything biological to you? He got silent for a moment. It was as if, just then, he realized that he had no simple explanation for his experiences. Experience 1. I was in my teens at a scout camp in the coastal mountains of Oregon, Camp Cooper, specifically. We and several other very experienced scouts were on an outpost camp, essentially an unsupervised overnight camp a handful of miles outside of camp. Anyway, there were, I think, about six of us. We had all grown up in scouts and had a lot of experience in backcountry travel and camping. So we arrive at a spot in a clearing that overlooks a large valley. There is nothing strange about them whatsoever. After several minutes of preparing our campsite, each of us was overcome with a distinct feeling of dread and fear. Its onset was immediate and distinctly felt by each of us. I remember very clearly feeling in danger and can still remember the feeling, this was over 15 years ago at this point. Essentially, we all looked at each other, pale in the face, and said, do you feel that? We all agreed that we did, and we hightailed it out of there and back to the main camp. Ultimately, nothing happened beyond that, but I found it interesting that everyone in our group had the same feeling of utter dread, coming on at the same time in an otherwise benign setting. Experience 2. Out on a long trail run in Shenandoah National Park two years ago, while descending the old rag fire road from Skyline Drive about a quarter of a mile uphill from where the junction is to turn left, I heard very loud stirring in the bushes to runner's left. I felt immediate fear and stopped in my tracks. Silence. I can see nothing in the bush, it was summer, so everything is very thick, and hear nothing. I continue several feet down the road, and the stirring follows down the road in the brush. Again, I stop. Silence. I move several more feet down the road, and the stirring follows. Stop. Silence. I repeat this over and over again for about 200 yards until I reach a sharp curve, and that is the end of my problems. This situation stands out in that whatever was in the bush was clearly aware of me, moving when I moved and stopping when I stopped. It could see me, but I could not see it. There are a lot of bears in the park, and I have encountered a number of them, and this encounter was quite different. My experience with bears in the park has been that they are far enough away off trail to not give two ducks about me and continue on their merry way. B. The bear and I startled each other when I came running around and saw a curve, and the bear turned and hightailed it into the woods. I have also had the distinct displeasure of being harassed by a mount lion in the Mount Jefferson wilderness, and this was quite different. Also, there are no more mountain lions in Virginia. So this experience on the fire road stands out to me. My wife and I love the Appalachian Mountains, but looking back now, I will be more cautious. 
there were two areas where my wife and I walked that had similar smells. One of the areas was in Cades Cove. We wanted to see the John Oliver cabin and decided to take the wooded route. There are two routes you can take towards the cabin, the open field route and the wooded route. It was just the two of us on the trail, I would say the small route was about a half mile or so, maybe longer. So it was a very beautiful walk, and we could hear a little rustling here and there along with birds chirping. Then we heard crows nearby, it sounded like the usual crow chat. What got my sweetheart and I to two-step our pace was this heavy, muggy, almost skunk-like smell that followed us. I told my wife that it smelled as if a skunk died and other animals died along with it, topped with bad body odor. Then we heard a loud crack, and my wife said, birds don't break tree branches in the woods. So we took off running until we saw the cabin and other people. It was so spooky. Needless to say, we ended up taking the open field route on our way back to the car. Okay, second day or so, we headed down towards North Carolina to see one of the waterfalls. The hike towards the falls was about 1.7 meters or so distant. Again, a very short distance, but it was nothing but uphill. There were two ladies that were heading back and said the waterfall was very beautiful, almost like a scene from Rivendell from The Lord of the Rings. As my wife and I were hiking upwards, that same weird, funky smell was following us. My wife was about 30 feet ahead of me, so I made sure to not lose sight of him. No other weird thing happened, just the smell was so horrid. The smell eventually faded after a while. I have no clue what it was or what kind of animal would give off that smell. I mean, I was raised in the country, so I know what all kinds of roadkill smell like. This was no roadkill. Anyone else smell a similar thing while out hiking in the woods? I would love to know. I don't know what I encountered in the Australian bushland. Just down the road from where a few years ago I had previously lived, in southeast Australia, is the opening into about 100 acres of woodlands and bush that I frequently went into when I was younger to do the usual things, riding, camping, etc. I was out driving at around 11.30 pm with my girlfriend, and as we were in the area, I decided to show her the woodlands while we were there, as she loves everything to do with nature, and it was summer, so it was an extremely warm night. I left my car with the lights shining into the trees as we weren't going too far in and it was pitch black inside, and the two of us just kind of sat chatting, having a smoke, and generally relaxing. She was sitting on a sort of map of the area that had been put in on some plastic, and I was keeping an eye on the trees as I had a feeling that something was just wrong. I've read on here that a few people have said that they have felt that they were in danger, although nothing around them was off. It was this same feeling, every sense was almost reaching out, and my adrenaline was up, but there wasn't really anything in my eyeline that seemed any different. After lighting another cigarette to calm my nerves, I scanned the tree line again and realized that it looked different than before. It was only after starting into the dark that I saw that there was moonlight now lighting up grass where it couldn't before, as there was a black shape blocking it that before I thought was a tree. I've got goosebumps just typing this, but the only way to describe it was that all sound just ceased and everything went dead silent, and a few seconds later, this disgusting feeling of dread fell over me, and I saw motion in the dark of the path as this thing crawled towards us on all fours. I've seen nearly every animal in the outback here, and we don't have any large predators like in the US or Europe, but somehow I knew this thing was a predator, and it wasn't hiding itself from us but just slowly crawling forward towards us. I don't know if my girlfriend saw it or not, as I couldn't look away, but just as it reached the line my car lights were able to illuminate, it reared up onto two legs and just sat staring at us. I am 6 feet 4 inches and this thing was about another meter larger than me, with arms that were far too long that reached down near the ground, and all I could make out was an off-white, almost yellowish fur on it and in the dim light I could make out the silhouette of its head as like a dog or wolf. I wasn't able to move as it stared at me, but at this point, my girlfriend gasped, which seemed to break whatever was stopping me from thinking logically. I grabbed her by the arm and sprinted to my car, slammed the doors, and tore out of there as fast as I could, both of us too scared to speak until about half an hour later. We've both discussed it many times, and the feeling that we had was what I imagine a rabbit sees when it catches a wolf or fox looking at it that this is something that would be able to end us with absolute ease if it so chose. Neither of us have been able to come up with any explanation for what it was, but it has definitely changed the way I view the woods and bush, and when I go camping or hiking now, I think back to that and wonder what it was and if I will ever see anything like it again. I went camping six years ago with a now ex-boyfriend of mine. The campsite we picked was beautiful, and we were able to drive in through some rough trails. The spot we picked was next to some hiking trails that weren't very far from some natural hot springs and a huge waterfall. We were in the middle of nowhere, absolutely no one was around. We set up camp next to the car, went hiking, soaked in the hot springs, came back, 
and had dinner. It was all very normal. Until we woke up the next day. I need to give some context as to how we slept that night so you can understand my confusion. Before we went to sleep, I put our food cooler in a stereo that we brought in the car and locked them. I put the keys in the front pocket of my backpack and put the backpack next to my sleeping bag on the far side of the tent, away from the door of the tent. My boyfriend at the time slept near the door of the tent with a gun next to him. We woke up the next morning, and I felt fine. I had slept hard, and from inside the tent, everything seemed normal. When we got out, our campsite was absolute chaos. The fire pit we had made was ruined. The cooler had been thrown, and food was scattered all over the place. The stereo was smashed to pieces and laid next to a tree. All of the car doors were open, including the trunk. We stood there for a minute in silence, just taking everything in. The woods felt off now, it was quiet and not the beautiful campsite that I saw yesterday. Everything about those woods feels wrong now. My ex accused me of not locking the car the night before and that an animal got in our stuff. I promised that I had locked it and went into the tent to grab the keys from my backpack, but they weren't there. I found them later on the ground, right next to the car. We quickly threw everything in the trunk and left. My boyfriend was quiet and wouldn't talk to me about what had just happened. He finally spoke up when we were almost home and told me that he had had a dream the night before about something kneeling over him in the tent, holding his gun, and just staring at him. When I tried to ask him more questions, he got quiet again and said he didn't want to talk about it and that I shouldn't talk about it anymore either. I've tried to forget about it, but I just can't. Something really wrong happened to us in the woods that night. I've only told two people this, now I'm telling everybody. I have no choice, it's consuming me. My brother believed me, he was sure it was someone physically messing with me. My son believed me when, after 800 hours of research, I came up with my invisible Bigfoot theory. Now he, too, is scared of the forest. It was another beautiful fall day. I had the day off work, and I had just moved into a new home in an area I had grown up in. It was nice to be back in the old neighborhood, close to great hiking trails, creeks, and the waterfall. I took off down the old Indian trail, which I knew like the back of my hand. As children, all the neighborhood kids played in the creek and forest. As teenagers, we spent every summer day and night there. When my children were young, I had them there every weekend. As teenagers, they also hung out there with their neighborhood friends. When I reach the end of the steep trail, which stops at the creek, I sit on the rocks, lay back, take a break, and stare at the sky. It was a perfect blue and yellow day, with not one cloud in the sky and the sun shining proudly on the world. I thought about that as I was sitting there, just relaxing and contemplating life. I was thinking what a beautiful, perfect place we live in, we have it all. I stood up to walk along the creek to reach the waterfall at the end. I took a few steps and stopped. I just stood there frozen, looking in front of me, there was nothing. I still stood there, I couldn't go any further. I could sense something. Then this overwhelming thought came into my head, loud and clear, you're not perfect, humans will always have fear, fear will destroy you. Something made me run, I was overcome with fear like I have never felt in my life. Something was there, I couldn't see it chasing me. I ran back the way I came at top speed, panic speed, and run for your life speed. Yes, it was chasing me. I heard steps, not like normal steps but exactly like little rocks or stones lightly landing on the forest floor without rolling or rustling the leaves. As I'm running back up the trail, I glance back, and I see nothing. Still running in a panic, I start to think this is ridiculous, I don't scare easily. I stop on the trail, turn around, and stand looking. In a split second, I can still hear the steps following me, yet I can't see anything unusual. I run and reach the top. I'm five minutes from home, so I run home. I call my brother. Of course, my brother believed me, he could hear the fear in my voice, and he was quite sensible about the whole thing. He suggested that it was teenagers fooling around like we used to all those years ago, or he suggested it might be a creepy man who was watching me. I agreed with him but knew differently, I must be losing my mind. Something did communicate with me that day and chased me out of the forest with a feeling of pure dread. I don't know if I'll ever be the same. I was on a youth group camping trip in New Hampshire. We were coming to a close after two days of uneventful camping, and I was tasked with going to tear down the archery range, a temporary makeshift affair we had set up for the youth to practice shooting with bows and arrows. The archery range was down the hill from the campsite and then down a slight slope to the left off the trail road to a small oval clearing abutting the woods and tree line. I walked down to the range by myself and started gathering up the equipment. I had finished making the pile for my first return trip when a very eerie feeling came over me. The sounds from the camp up the hill had faded away, 
and it was perfectly quiet and still. Not a whisper of a breeze. There was a humming or vibration in the air that I sensed in me, if that makes sense. For some inexplicable reason, I snapped my head to the right to view the tree line and noticed there was an area with a thinner brush like an opening, and I started walking towards it, like I was being drawn. As I cleared the tree line and stepped into the woods proper, I could feel the pull to go deeper into the woods become much stronger. Looking ahead, the woods were in deep shadow, with a strange group of four trees about 75 feet away lit by a shaft of light beaming at an angle from above. The light wasn't the normal afternoon yellow sunlight, but a very strange golden color. The light hit the trees in such a way that the bases of the trees were glowing in a beckoning way. With the rest of the woods in shadow and the trees lit up, it created a weird tunnel vision. The compulsion to go investigate the four trees was now almost overwhelming. The thought of come see. Come quickly. Come right now. Was insistent. My head was pounding, like a headache without the pain. As I was about to take another step forward, another separate feeling from the depths of my being started screaming at me to stop immediately. I instantly, viscerally knew that, despite how enticing this call was, if I proceeded forward towards those trees, I would be lost in the world. That specific impression, lost to the world, scared me deeply. The feelings of this is not right. And danger. Were palpable to me. This somehow overrode the compulsion. I quickly looked backwards to the opening, and I could see the bow sitting on the ground, and I think seeing a bit of reality helped me break the hold of the call. I suddenly felt a hollow pit in my stomach, and I started tracing a path slowly backwards towards the opening. I kept my eyes on those trees, like I was facing down a predator. I didn't want to turn my back on them. I couldn't turn my back on them, making it back and stepping through the opening to the archery range, my head almost instantly cleared. I could again hear noises from the camp and feel the wind. I looked at where I had just stepped from, and it now felt normal. I immediately grabbed the first load of equipment and headed back to camp. For some reason, I didn't tell anyone at camp what I experienced. On my subsequent trip to get the last load of equipment, absolutely everything was normal, but I stayed the hell away from that opening. What stands out to me is the loss to the world impression. It was so clear, ominous, and final. I can't express how truly drawn I was to go deeper into those woods, the feeling to give myself over to it, whatever it was, I do know that something bad would have happened if I hadn't heeded that warning. I know that my experience was very real and very scary. I am also convinced that I wouldn't have come out if I had kept going that day. I was camping with a friend in an area of British Columbia with grizzly bears, black bears, and cougars. While sitting at the campfire after sunset, as it was just getting dark, we heard a sort of grunting or growing noise coming from the bushes not far from our campsite. We ignored the first one or two, but after the noise kept occurring every couple of minutes, it caught our attention. We went to look around to see if we could identify what was making the noise and, hopefully, scare it off. The noise continued every few minutes and eventually became louder. We assumed the source was getting closer to us, and adrenaline was pumping. It's worth mentioning that all we had on us was a knife each, as we'd forgotten to bring bear spray and didn't have any guns with us on this trip. Next thing we know, we hear a sound from behind us which I can only describe as an entire tree getting ripped out of the ground, split in two, and thrown to the ground again. Huge crashing noise. Then there was dead silence. We sprinted back to the car and climbed inside, peering out into the darkness, trying to spot any signs of movement or whatever. We couldn't see or hear anything. We never saw a glimpse of whatever made the noise, and the next morning we searched extensively but couldn't even find any signs of recently broken branches or fallen trees. We did find one cougar track the next day a few hundred meters away on a sandy creek bed, but I don't know if that was related to it because the creek was in a different area from the noise. I still have no idea if it was a bear, a cougar, a sasquatch, or something else. Needless to say, I didn't sleep at all that night. My partner and I are avid hikers. Last July, we went on a trip and decided to camp at this spot we love, just west of Shenandoah. It's quiet, off the beaten path and offers absolutely spectacular views of both Shenandoah and portions of George Washington National Forest to the west. The first day and evening of the trip itself were nice and uneventful, though we didn't sleep super well because of the humidity. The next morning, we decided to go for a hike in a portion of Jefferson Forest we'd never been to before. It's comprised of ATV trails and about a dozen campsites, but has a trail that leads to an old fire tower we'd always wanted to check out. It was about a 45-minute drive from our campsite, mostly on back roads. When we got there, the first thing that stuck out to us was how empty the campsites were. We actually didn't camp there the night before because we'd heard that the site is usually packed, and we knew we wouldn't arrive early enough on the weekend to get a spot. There were only two spots taken. 
In one were a desiccated tent and a bunch of garbage. It looked like someone had been there for a while, but it was deserted when we arrived. On the other hand, there was a young woman, I'm guessing in her late teens, setting up a small backpacking tent. There was a truck and one other smaller car in the parking area. We parked and started getting our gear together, and the woman approached us to ask if we knew where the trailhead was. I told her that we'd read that it branched off about 100 yards into one of the ATV tracks, but we weren't 100% sure which. Since I was getting such weird vibes from the place, I kind of hoped she'd stick around and go with us to find it, but she just thanked us and took off in the general direction of the trail. We set off and walked up and down a few of the ATV trails until we found the walking path. We saw two ATVs shoot by us at one point but otherwise didn't encounter anyone else, including the woman from earlier. It took us about an hour to get to the top of the mountain, where the fire tower was. It's an old metal structure, and you have to climb a narrow set of stairs to get to the top of it. We got up, looked around, took some pictures, and started heading down, honestly, the view was kind of a letdown. About halfway down, very suddenly, everything stopped, the birds, the bugs, it was dead silent. And I don't know quite how to put this into words, but it felt like the ancientness of the forest was contorting and crushing us. I felt trapped and cornered in spite of the expanse around us. My partner and I looked at each other and wordlessly started to book it out of there. We started running back to the car, but the feeling only followed us. As we were rounding one of the switchbacks, we heard this unearthly shriek, like a cross between metal on metal and a choir screaming off key. And we saw something. I just got a glimpse of it before we blacked out. I don't know how to describe it other than that it looked huge despite clearly not taking up much physical space and moving in writhes and flashes. It didn't have a color, it just felt like evil and emptiness. I probably only perceived it for half a second before my memory just completely gave way. When we came, we were sitting in the car, and two hours had passed, double the length of time it took us to get up there. I don't know if I lost consciousness or just somehow blocked those hours out, I learned later that the exact same thing had happened to my partner. Both of the cars were next to us in the parking lot, and there were still just the two tents at the campsite. The woman wasn't in hers, and it looked exactly the same as she'd left it. I think about her all the time and have spent a ton of time trying to figure out if someone went missing around the time of our trip. It took a few months for my partner and I to talk about that day. We still love to hike but honestly haven't been able to in Appalachian Forest since this happened. I'm curious if others have had other experiences like this. I like hiking a lot, but I don't have friends, so I tend to go alone most of the time. I only ever go for day hikes and nothing overnight in the woods, but I heard something that made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. I know the rules, so I just pretended it didn't happen. I went to my destination and then went home. But what happened was that I was a mile or so from my turnaround point. For context, I'm from Florida, and my only family that lives outside of Florida is my mom in Alabama. While hiking, my grandma called my name. It was clear as day, there was no mistaking it. She has a weird way of saying my name when she's mad at me, kind of like a nickname, but it's just my name, twisted a little. There was absolutely no denying that my grandma was pissed, almost screaming my name. It didn't sound close, but it didn't sound far away either. If I had to guess from memory, I'd say roughly 100 feet or so. I knew I wasn't supposed to answer it, look for it, run, or even acknowledge it in any way. I just looked down at my feet and followed the trail. I got to the turnaround point, and as I was walking back about the same area, I heard my name. There were five or six small trees down in the middle of the trail that were not there on the way in. I instantly felt like I was being watched, but I heard nothing. I had a weird feeling that I needed to get moving fast, but I also felt as though I should not walk around the trees at all, so I just stepped over, and there were all the branches. As I walked over the trees, I remember feeling something like a burning sensation on the back of my neck, kind of like a sunburn. I tried my best to pay no mind to the feeling and just walked as quickly as I could back to the car, but it wasn't very fast as it's been about 6 miles at this point and I'm going uphill. After about an hour, the feelings of being watched and the burning went away. I got back to my car and drove faster than anyone should feel comfortable with down the mountain. I just started thinking about it again and was wondering if anyone knew what it might have been. My friend and I went up a mountain trail in our town on July 6, 2023. We went to the normal trail parking lot. Took the main trail, then veered off onto a smaller trail to the right. We wanted to get to the little hill on the right that looked over the town. On the way there, we were already deciding when we were going to come back because it was so beautiful, and we were just in awe. We get to the top of the little hill, eat some McDonald's, and talk for like an hour or two. It's starting to get dark, so we start to pack up to leave before it gets dark. When we were leaving, we were originally playing music. About 20 seconds in, 
I decided to stop the music because I thought I could hear someone talking, a man, but assumed it was the music. After the music stopped, I kept hearing someone talking. My friend and I are almost completely silent, walking at a fast pace together. It was unspoken, but you could feel the tension and that something wasn't right. My friend is in front, and I am behind. After a bit, I start to get the feeling that someone's behind me, specifically to my right. I was too scared to see what was behind me. At some point, my friend stops abruptly and looks to her right. She seems scared of something, almost as if someone has grabbed her shoulder, but I was in panic mode and could tell she was too, and so I said, go go, keep going, so she starts walking even faster with me right behind, the trail is small. About 5 to 10 seconds later, I hear the voices again, and I ask my friend, do you hear that? Again. No less than a few seconds later, my right ear starts ringing really loudly, and I hear a very vivid and loud hear me. In a man's voice. I flipped my shit I tell my friend to walk faster, and we bolted to my car. The trail we took was only an 8 to 10 minute walk normally, and we were walking fast and running, so it took a lot less time for all of that to go down. We get into my car, and after a few seconds of silence, we both say something along the lines of what the duck slash hell slash shit, and we both talk about what we felt. Both of us heard voices but assumed it was the music or something. The voices seemed close enough that we should have been able to see the person, but we couldn't. Both of us felt something very heavy to our right. Hence my friend looking to her right, me feeling something to my right, and my right ear ringing. We both agreed we weren't alone, and that was creepy as hell. Both of us were shaking for, like, an hour after that because of the adrenaline. We have not gone back. I called my close friend to tell her what happened, and I knew she was spiritual. She told me I needed to call her mom as soon as possible. I did. I explained everything to her mom, who started to do some research. She finds out that the exact spot that we were walking in used to be a Native American tribe's homeland before they were forcefully removed by settlers, which we had no idea about, which we think is why they just wanted to be heard. They were hurting from being displaced from their home and just wanted someone to hear them. I have never had an experience like that before. Supernatural stuff is junk to me, but I experienced it. At least, I experienced something, and weird doesn't even begin to describe it. I was hiking the long trail in Vermont with a really large Irish setter dog. We had crossed the headwaters of the Winhall River, heading north for Stratton Mountain. We came up a long, rocky ledge and were about to take a left turn at a point where a stump, about the height of a man, was standing on the left. As I and my dog approached this stump, I heard a humming sound, low-pitched and somehow unpleasant, coming from that stump. It was not an animal growling, it was not a radio playing, it was the stump itself vibrating with this sinister sound. It was like the damn monolith in 2001, a space odyssey. I can laugh about it now, but at the time, there I was, confronted with a phenomenon that was absolutely not part of my vocabulary of the natural world, to put it mildly. The vibration shook my intestines, it was that powerful. My dog went nuts. He raised his hackles, snarled, growled, and salivated, and, brother, let me tell you, I was terrified. And alone. I went around that stump on the uphill side and gave it a very wide berth. I never saw anyone out there I could tell about it, and until now I have not the slightest idea what it was. My parents divorced when I was 12, and my mom moved us into a small town in the Pennsylvania mountains. After a few months of living there, I went back to live with my dad in Texas. Ever since then, though, I have heard the voices of people I know calling me into the woods. It's been almost 8 years now. It's only when I'm alone, but not every time I'm alone and it seems to only happen in Texas. It's weird, but I never even considered that this might be something to be concerned about until recently. It was just something that happened. I even followed the voice once and only thought it was kind of weird that I had heard my dad screaming for me if he didn't actually call me because I got home later and asked him about it. A few years ago, I was about a mile out in the woods in Pennsylvania when I zoned out for a minute. When I zoned back in, I heard a stick snap and looked over to see a white-tailed doe staring at me from about 10 to 15 feet away. It looked almost as though it had been trying to sneak closer to me when I looked at it. I just sort of backed away from it and went back down the mountain. I'm not entirely sure what to make of this now that I'm looking back on all the times I just sort of brushed it off as normal. What are y'all's thoughts on this? I'm 17 years old, and I live in Oklahoma. My mom, grandma, and her dog decided to have a girl's day out, which included going to Parallel Forest for some hiking. It was about sunset when we arrived, and we went hiking. After a few minutes of hiking, I sort of noticed a figure within the tree line, it was like. Dear God or the Beast if you ever played Spooky's Jumpscare Manision or watched over the garden wall, but it didn't have flesh nor skin, 
and it wasn't made out of wood, just the antlers, bone, and skull of a deer. I figured, A, don't bother it, and it won't bother me, don't be a nuisance to the forest. I eventually sprayed it for my mom, I kept her within view and made sure she wasn't too far away, my grandma was still in the car at this point in time. And looked around, and eventually found a tipped over tree and decided, I like rocks, rocks are cool. And as I looked down, looking at any particular looking ones in my collection, a black one caught my eye, and I took it. When I stood up, it kind of felt like dereality. Is all I can describe it as since it felt exactly as I do when I derealize? I knew I was within this reality, but something was just intently wrong, so I put it down as best I could to how I found it since it was rather clear the forest was telling me it wasn't mine and I wasn't allowed to keep it. Then. Everything just kept being wrong, it was blowing wind, but it was only the sound of the wind, there was zero movement, there was zero sound within the forest, like it all just froze. And then I felt a sort of feeling I've never felt before, like whatever that thing I saw earlier was, it was trying its damnedest to trick me. I went to my mom and explained something was trying to trick me, and we decided to leave. We ran into grandma, and I asked mom if it was really her, and mom just said we'd find out. Sue. We began walking, mom had me hold her hand and stay on the path, and we began sort of hearing. A crow? But it wasn't a crow, it was like it was trying to mimic a crow but taking breaths in between to cry or scream. We kept walking, and I walked a bit ahead, I'm a fast walker and wanted to get out of there but didn't want to run for obvious reasons. And it just kept getting louder. In the way some creatures get louder the further they are, it was figuring out where we were through noise and wanted us to make noise. I tried telling my grandma and mom to be quieter, but they refused and kept trying to speak to them, quite in character for them, that's not odd in the slightest. But it kept going to me, specifically to the point where it was directly on top of me. It decided to put away the crow act and began mimicking an owl, and I just felt incredibly sick, like, possibly? Anyxty sick since I do have an anyxty disorder. Whenever we left the forest, it began mimicking a coyote for some reason and just kept going even as we left, I know for a fact it's neither a wendigo nor a skinny, I'm thinking it's possibly? A pixie? I'm unsure and just want a name for whatever it was. I'm an experienced outdoorsman. I live in the mountains of northwest Colorado. I worked as a fishing guide and have spent many nights camping in the backcountry. The area where I live is surrounded by a national forest. Having lived in several cities, I've always been more comfortable in the woods than anywhere. I decided to go on an afternoon hike. I like a particular trail where I park about 6 miles from home. I parked and saw one other truck. I drank water and ate a sandwich before locking everything, including my phone and gun, in the truck. I intentionally traveled light so I could move fast. I only planned about 30 minutes in and 30 minutes back. Wearing running shoes, shorts, a t-shirt, and a bright yellow baseball hat. It is notable that the hat is so obnoxiously bright that friends say it probably scares fish. I started running around 2 p.m., as the first few miles are relatively flat. The trail follows a creek that flows off a mountain through a canyon. There are several trails that branch off, heading up into the mountains. Prefer a particular trail that follows the edge of the canyon with a creek flowing below. It's absolutely gorgeous. Before the trail gets steep, it takes you through a large aspen grove. There is a point about 30 minutes in where I plan to turn around. The trail becomes increasingly less worn and more difficult beyond this point. I have visited the area many times. Something felt off this time. I didn't feel normal. I moved through the aspen grove before taking a steep trail up the mountain when I got a strange feeling. I stopped and noticed that it was quiet. Something made me look up the mountain to the right at a point several hundred yards above. I noticed a large granite rock formation. The area is off trail, so I'd never looked there before. I thought I saw movement. Probably a black bear, as they are common. I was curious, so I pressed on. I was definitely not scared at this point, but I noticed the silence. I continued hiking and reached the point where I planned to turn around. I decided to hike further, hoping to see what caught my eye earlier. The trail becomes overgrown and harder to follow at this point. I had been further than this before but was never off trail. I noticed an aspen tree bent over the trail. It had been uprooted and broken off. The tree was green, so it was odd. It could have been a lightning strike, but it wasn't clear. I walked maybe another eighth mile, then took a right off the trail, heading in the direction of granite rocks. I wasn't concerned about getting lost since it was easy to orient myself in the canyon and creek. I hiked off the trail up toward a large meadow with many granite boulders. Reflecting on it, something was compelling me to go to the meadow, I was scrambling up a hill to get to where I could sit. I got to the meadow and noticed the rocks. It looked like a granite fortress. I sat down on a log, 
enjoying the scenery. Looking down into the canyon at the creek below, meadows and rocks were behind me. I looked around and didn't see any animals. I suddenly noticed it was dead quiet. It had been a sunny, warm day, with birds and bugs everywhere. I wasn't scared yet, but I noticed the extreme silence. I could hear the creek before, so it wasn't as startling as now. I began taking off my running shoes. This is notable as this isn't something I normally do since I have permanent nerve damage to my right ankle. I walk or run with a limp and sometimes wear a brace. I remember feeling like my feet were burning. It wasn't particularly hot, and it was not over 70 F. I was becoming unnerved by the dead silence and started tying my shoes. This is where things turn weird. I clearly heard my father call me by my first name. The voice was loud and came from behind. I talked to my father earlier in the day. He was at his home in Georgia. There was no way he was calling from the rocks behind me. I immediately became overcome with fear. It is difficult to describe how overwhelming it is. I began sweating and shaking. It was like knowing a lion is stalking without seeing it, but more terrifying. Definitely not ducking around at this point. I stood up and turned to look behind me, and I saw nothing but the large granite rocks. Started hauling asses down the hill towards the canyon and trail below. I was absolutely terrified and felt something was chasing me. Literally stumbled, fell, and rolled down the mountain. I stood up and couldn't recognize anything. It looked completely different. No canyon, creek, or trail. It was cloudy, and I wasn't in the same place anymore. At this point, I started hauling ass in what I thought was the right direction. I eventually found the trail and recognized my location. I sprinted through the Aspen Grove back to the truck. I didn't look at the watch. I'm not sure how long I was gone. I was so terrified, I could hardly drive home. I'm not sure what happened, but I've never been so afraid for my life. I know something was stalking and chasing me. Yes, I have gone back to the area. Too afraid to go to the same meadow with granite boulders. I consider going back well armed, but instincts tell me it's a bad place. I'll never hike again without my .357 Magnum and haven't since. Something scared the hell out of me, and I feel I was close to being a victim. I trust that my flight instinct kicked in for a good reason. This took place a few years ago. I was with my best friend, and we decided to go camping at a campsite in Flagstaff named Lockett Meadow. We had taken our dogs, and after a day of hiking and exploration, we played around a fire and eventually went to sleep. I awoke in the middle of the night to find this deep figure outside our tent, burying itself in our tent. It had a weird way of hovering back and forth over my body and my dog, who is curled up awake and is not moving or making a sound at the bottom of my feet. I look over and see my best friend passed out and his dog, which I'm unsure if was awake, but clearly I was the only one between my friend and me that's experiencing this terrifying encounter. I eventually covered my head and thought about anything to make me fall asleep. The next day, I asked my friend if he had somehow been awake through all that I explained, and he replied no and thought I was lying. I told him maybe it was a bear, so we looked around our campsite and couldn't find anything. No trails, no prints, nothing. We also had food out on a table near our tents, and a trash bag was hung up on a broken branch. So even if it was a bear, I'm surprised it didn't get into any of our stuff. Either way, I remember how scared shless I was to see this weird, dark object observing our tent. Could it have been the wind? A deer? A bear? Who knows, but this is just one encounter out of the whole camping trip. The next night we decided to camp at Beaver Creek, mind you, you were in Arizona if you wished to know, however, before we wanted to settle in, we explored Sedona, drove to Oak Creek, and parked our car near a trail down to the water. We took our dogs and hiked to the creek. After we finished jumping in and swimming, we dried off and were about to head out. Next thing you know, we see from the corner of our eyes a big rock being thrown near us, making a big splash in the water. We looked up and couldn't see anything above, so we ran over stones and rocks to get a clear view of the top and saw nobody. We yelled out foul words about you and stuff and heard no one running off or anything. When we got to our next campsite at Beaver Creek and set up, my friend told me that throughout the trip since we started in Flagstaff, he had rocks being thrown at him up until that big-ass rock at Oak Creek. We looked at each other and thought maybe someone was following and messing with us. Then we sort of laughed it off and said that it was impossible and that we were just trying to connect the dots to have it be a cool look-back adventure. Well, I'm glad it didn't turn into part 3 because nothing happened that night going to the next day, where we packed up and headed home with nothing but a memory to be justified. My story happened in North Carolina. It wasn't my house, but a close friend. He had just gotten off work, and living in a rural area, drinking tended to sum up his idea of fun if and when he wasn't hanging out with anyone. I wasn't a local, 
but I knew some of the area fairly well. While I hadn't explored the woods around my friend's house, I had been in and around them fairly often, and I knew the majority of the nearby trails and where they led to and ended up to a certain extent. I knew enough to feel comfortable walking alone, and I knew where to stop and turn back since I lacked knowledge of the area. Also, at certain points, people's property starts intersecting, and while no one has ever pointed a gun at me or anything, I have seen large dogs on the edge of places like this, and they growl quite a bit. They seem to get more aggressive the closer I approach, but if I turn away, they also turn away. Weird, but okay. You can train dogs to be like that and to attack only if you approach within a certain range, so that's typical. Anyway, I went a different route, and when I say different, I mean that loosely. I went a familiar route, but then decided to go off path a little. There is a stream that connects to a nearby lake, but the stream sort of circles around the entire neighborhood and, in some places, continues on into the town itself that my friend lived outside of. To be a small stream, it's pretty long and flows all year. At one point, while off trail, I found where a large tree had been knocked over and had formed a bridge I could cross. I had never walked on that side of the stream before, and curiosity got the better of me since, while the stream could be jumped across if I got a running head start, it just hadn't even occurred to me to walk on the other side. I had never thought about it before. I still knew where I was and could still remember how I had gotten to where I was, so I knew how to get back. Anyway, I don't know when it happened. I don't remember leaving the stream. I had been walking next to the stream, just following it, when suddenly I was surrounded by woods, no stream, not even the sound of running water. And it was silent. It made no sense. I tried finding my way back, and then the next strange part happened. I came to this place where everything was just beautiful. I can't explain what I mean any better. Everything was perfect. The trees seemed to be taller, more vibrant, and almost alive. Flower bushes, beautiful plants I can't describe with exotic colors of fruits, leaves, and flowers, chirping birds, chittering squirrels, so much color. It was so beautiful, it seemed fantasy-like and unreal. I mean, I'm leaving stuff out since I'm not good at describing this sort of thing, but it felt so extremely peaceful. I felt like I had walked into the literal Garden of Eden. Then, as I started looking around, I noticed I couldn't move. I mean, it was like my feet were glued to where they were. I could move my arms, legs, and head, and so on, but I couldn't take a step further into wherever this beautiful place was. I also noticed I kept seeing these little things moving around me. They were smaller than birds but larger than any insect, and there were many of them, and I swear it, but they seemed to be talking, but all hushed, so I couldn't understand them or even hear if they were speaking any language I could possibly have known, but I could hear them. It was like whispering, but also like the sound was being carried all around me, like it was echoing or something. It's hard to explain. They never seemed to come close enough for me to make out what they were, and I couldn't move a step towards them, but they always remained just on the edge of my eyesight, and curiously enough, any time they grew even slightly closer, my eyes would sort of blur, and it's like my vision would lose focus and I wouldn't be able to see exactly how they looked. So they remained these small, flying things that sort of seemed like they were talking, whispering, and flying, larger than an insect but smaller than a bird. Somehow, I wasn't being allowed to see whatever they were or traverse into wherever I was. I don't understand it. The next thing I know, I'm standing by the stream again, with no memory of returning. The sun is setting also, which means I've been out in the woods for most of the entire day, when to me it felt like it had only been an hour, maybe two. Instead, Eight to nine hours have passed since I got to my buddy's place before 10 a.m. Ike. I have no explanation for any of that, but it sure seemed like fairies to me. My experience in the woods of eastern Nevada. So I've been to this area camping a few times, and in the past I've always camped at the campgrounds. In the last few years, my current girlfriend actually prefers roughing it, so we make it a point to camp in the middle of nowhere without anybody around. When we go on camping trips, we usually do multi-day overlanding, 4x4, four four, style, so we stay in a different place almost every night where most people won't go. This brings me to the first night of our 5-day camping trip on July 4, 2019. This particular night was one of the weirdest camping experiences I've ever had in my 30 plus years of camping, and I really didn't know how weird it was until I arrived home. So I had found this spot a few miles from the organized campground a few years ago, and I just put it in my memory bank. It's pretty easy to find because it's not far off of a main dirt road, and I can tell it was usually used during the hunting season. When we camp, we always bring our dog, a mini American Shepherd. She usually runs around exploring, but this afternoon she just stayed near us the whole time. I just thought she didn't feel good after the three-hour ride there. As the sun went down, we started a fire, 
ate some burgers, and I was smoking a tobacco pipe. We were just looking at the stars. In any case, that is my honest, God-given experience. I was completely sober, and I'm not the type to go looking for paranormal stuff, nor have I ever experienced or heard anything like that before or since. And yes, I've been camping since. I'm still trying to wrap my head around it when I think about it. I live in a lively college town. This happened at a park in an urban setting near a local river. There's a part of this park that is a clearing designated as a river overlook with an adjacent short trail veering off into the woods that first snakes around some trees and rocks and then runs parallel to the river. On Thursday, a friend and I visited the park to explore and jog outdoors. After first checking out the clearing, I was drawn to an opening in the tree line that appeared to be a trail. We were having a fairly deep personal conversation at the time, but I remember pausing to tell him, I really want to see what's down this trail right now, to which he replied, me too. We walked up the trail a short distance when we first saw that the trail was obstructed by a razor wire fence. I saw a guy heading in our direction on the trail, walking towards us, but on the other side of the fence. I didn't pay much attention to him but just internally acknowledged his presence. He was a college-aged guy with shoulder-length chestnut brown hair, a blue pattern t-shirt, and was carrying a skateboard in his right arm. This is a bit strange considering we are on a dirt trail, but it didn't immediately register with me as odd. Kids do weird things sometimes. My friend and I turned around upon seeing the fence and headed back towards the clearing, still deep in conversation and more or less tuning out our surroundings. I looked back and saw that the guy was on our side of the fence now and walking behind us, which I thought was strange as it would be difficult to get over so quickly and quietly. I glanced back at least twice on the way back to the clearing to see him following us back down the trail, the last time being once we had reached the clearing. After reaching the clearing, my friend needed to pee, and I advised him that there was someone following us out of the woods. He gave me a strange look and told me that he didn't see anyone. I turned around, expecting to see the guy in the clearing, but there was no one there. We went back up the trail to look around and saw no trace of him anywhere. The fence in question stretched downwards from an embankment, across the trail, and all the way to the riverside, so there wouldn't have been an easy way to traverse it or get around it in any way. It was a definite WTF moment, as my friend insisted there was no one there the entire time. I was basically defensively interrogating him because I was dumbfounded that he didn't notice that guy from the very beginning as we approached the fence. I didn't feel threatened by his presence, but I was intrigued after he seemingly vanished. We looked all over without a sign of him. I live in rural Idaho, about 5 miles from a reservation. Growing up, we heard all sorts of stories and legends surrounding the res. I have to admit, I was a bit of a skeptic when it came to the things we heard. My best friend and I have always been drawn to the paranormal. When we were about 16 or 17, we decided we'd go for drives on the res at night. The area we live in has a very tight-knit community, and our little town has just over 10,000 people. We basically have no crime, and everyone feels pretty safe. So driving around at night is no big deal. We went on our night drives fairly often with no experiences to note. One day, we heard a story from someone at school about an abandoned schoolhouse on the other side of the reservation. Just past the schoolhouse, there was supposed to be a small bridge that went over a large farming canal. The story was that if you drove to the bridge and turned your car off, you could hear water babies. If you don't know what water babies are, there are many different stories and legends stemming from Native American culture. Go look them up. So anyway, we decided that was going to be our next driving destination. Neither of us had ever heard a water baby cry, so we were interested. That night after dark, we jumped in my car and started driving out there. The closer we got to the schoolhouse, the more uneasy I began to feel. We drove past the building that was supposedly the schoolhouse and stopped on the bridge. I cut the lights and killed the engine. Silence. There was no sound but the rushing water below the bridge. We sat there for what felt like forever. In reality, probably only four or five minutes had gone by. We heard nothing but the water. We started joking about the story being fake and decided that it was a bust and to just go home. The keys were still in the ignition, so I simply tried to start the car. Nothing. The dash lights lit up, but it just wouldn't turn over. I'd never had any problems with my car before this. I tried it a couple more times while talking with my friend, not wanting to freak her out. About the third or fourth time, I turned to her and said, I don't want to freak you out or anything, but my car won't start. Her eyes grew wide, and she responded with, you're ducking with me, right? I wish I had been. We sat there for a minute, just staring at each other, not knowing what to do. If we called my mom, there would definitely be some ass chewing for being out on the res so late at night. So we decided to call one of our friends who had a truck. If the battery was just dead, he could give us a jump. 
If not, he could tow us back to town. So we called and waited, sitting in the middle of this bridge in my dead car, frustrated by the lack of experience and car troubles, we just wanted to go home. That's when I saw it. It's a well-known fact that the reservation has packs of wild dogs that roam around killing livestock, and there have been a few instances of them attacking kids and putting them in the hospital. This was no dog. I've seen coyotes and wolves, and there was no way in hell this thing was either of those things. It was skeletal, like a malnourished animal, and was walking in all fours. Slow and low to the ground, it was walking along the canal toward the bridge. I smacked my friend, making her turn to look at what I was staring at. We both stared in disbelief at this creature slowly coming toward us. Instinctively, I honked the horn. At least that still worked. That's where things got really weird. This thing stood up on two legs. Arms limp at their sides. I legit screamed. I had never seen anything like this in my entire life. The best way I can think of to describe it is that it looked like Professor Lupin's werewolf form in the Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban movie. It was freaking massive. It stood between 8 and 9 feet tall and was staring right at us. It took a couple steps forward. My friend and I were frozen. We were trapped in my car, which wouldn't start. As it slowly started walking toward us, headlights appeared in the distance. As the lights came closer, the creature dropped back to all fours and took off for the hills, where I assume it came from. Our friend pulled up to help us, and both my creeped out friend and I kept quiet about what we had just witnessed. He walked up to the car, and I rolled my window down. He suggested we push the car off the bridge to the side of the road and pop the hood. So I threw it in neutral and got it to the side of the road. My friend asked me to pop the hood and try to start the car. So, I did. The damn car started right up. I don't know what caused it to not start before, but that night I had an experience I'll never forget. I don't go out on the road anymore at night. I'd really rather not see whatever it was that night again. Near Timothy Lake, where a couple of hikers encountered a light doorway with a dark shadow within it. A few UFO sightings, though nothing too substantial with that. Another encounter with an entity that was 11 tilde foot and very stocky and thin was witnessed. There is this report of what is presumed to be a Sasquatch who telepathically communicated with someone. Linda Kennedy was camping by a creek near Mount Hood, and the sun had set and the last of the light was about gone when she suddenly felt something watching her. Glancing up, she saw a silhouette in the twilight, crouched down with its hands in the water, like it was washing them. It looked up and saw the witness. Thinking it was a bear, the witness became terrified. All of a sudden she heard in her head, almost like somebody saying, I'm not going to hurt, and you're not going to hurt me. Reaching for her nearby glasses to get a better look, when she turned back, they had run off into the bushes. She reported the creature as having four and a half inches of hair all over. No other description. I live in Colorado, and Rocky Mountain National Park is pretty close to me. I'm pretty outdoorsy, and so I tend to walk and hike all over my beautiful state. Usually, just do day trips or 24-hour stays outdoors. Quick campfires and small meals, me and my dog mostly. I was hiking just last fall in Grand Lake on a trail called Tanahutu Creek. It was about 1.45 p.m. The dog wasn't with me at the time because they're not allowed on trails, so it was just me and myself. I was walking southeast when suddenly the area went completely silent. No wind, no animals, not even the smell of the outdoors. It's like I walked into a bubble where nothing existed or where everything was muted. I took out my phone to check the time, and it was just after 3.45. Though it seemed like there was a weird fog around me. I kept walking. The silence is still there, and the odd feeling is too. I walked for another 10 to 15 minutes when I turned my attention to the sky. The clouds seemed to be moving rapidly, as if a storm was coming. The forecast did not call for any rain or snow that day, it was odd to see low-hanging clouds that were moving so rapidly, almost as if I were viewing a time-lapse video. I heard a rumble that came from the ground, it was emanating from what I assumed was deep below. A large crack that sounded like thunder ended the rumble. The clouds stopped moving quickly but had a very light pink or purple tinge to them. At this point, I was speedwalking, trying to get out. My fight or flight response seemed to kick in, and my adrenaline was pumping. The odd feeling in my gut turned to complete terror, yet there was nothing around me that would evoke such a feeling. No wildlife, no bears, no mountain lions. Another crack and a flash of light later, everything seemed to be completely normal. The wind returned, and the birds that filled the air with sound were now replaced with the sound of crickets. The only strange thing now was the time. It was 6.30 p.m. I was already on my way back to the truck before this all happened, but it. It should not have taken me that long to get back to the trailhead. It only seemed like 15 minutes had passed, and yet more than 4 hours had elapsed. 
I have no recollection of what happened at that time, besides what I have told you here today. I have only told a few people this. Some said I was abducted, others said I entered a time slip. Either way, I wanted to share. So I experienced what I believe was a time slip. So this happened in the mid-90s in Florida, in Blackwater River State Park. It is only a state park, not a national one. Blackwater has very extensive and very popular trails that connect to other trails. Although not officially a part of the Appalachian Trail, there are trails that join up to the trail. It is very popular for hiking. Me and a bunch of my friends decided to go out to Carrick for a three-day weekend. Not at all unusual, as we frequently camped at Carrick and other sites in northwest Florida. We packed up and headed out on Friday, nothing unusual for us. We were all between the ages of 16 and 22. Most of us were still in high school, with the exception of my friend's boyfriend, who was 22. He was also the most experienced camper and a former Eagle Boy Scout. We set up at a designated primitive site, a good way away from most of the other sites near a trailhead. We actually didn't realize how well-traveled that particular trail was, and we had tons of foot traffic near our tent. If we had known, we probably wouldn't have picked that site. The whole park was disappointingly packed with campers and hikers. In fact, all the parking lots were full. I guess the weather probably brought people out. Now none of us were planning any extensive hikes, as the goal of the weekend wasn't really extensive hiking per se and was more about camping. But of course Blackwater is known for hiking trails, so we figured we would probably all be going on and off on short hikes out and about to enjoy the scenery. It was fall, and the weather was gorgeous. We had purposely waited for the weather to cool and turn. Only masochists go camping in the dead humidity and heat of summer in Florida, not to mention the bugs. LOL. We also chose that weekend because those of us in high school. Most of us had Monday off. Nothing of note really happened, and we were all having a good time. We even went for a few group and solitary hikes off the loop. Nothing noteworthy. So anyway, long story short, I get up very early on Sunday before the sun rises and decide I'm going on a short solo hike. I tell my tentmate what trial I'm going on and when I should be back. No biggie. I eat a decent sized breakfast, and I grab some water and head out. So I head out on this trail, sunrise, and I'm having a great time. The trail is clearly marked with blazes and signs of landmarks, with miles at regularly marked intervals. It is a very well-maintained and heavily traveled trail. I decide I'm going to hike to the nearest landmark, about 1.5 miles in and 1.5 miles back. At the time, I was a pretty experienced hiker and in excellent physical shape, as I was an athlete in more than one team sport. I could hike at a pace far quicker than most. But I allotted two hours. Seemed reasonable, so I hiked to the place and stayed for about 10 minutes, if that was because it was disappointingly unsensical. In fact, I was actually kind of irritated because I knew there were much prettier and more scenic hikes I could have taken for the same amount of time. I felt like it was such a waste on the last day of the trip. But I headed back. Nothing on the walk to or back seemed unusual. No bad feelings, nothing. The only thing that was odd was that I encountered not one single other hiker on the trail. But I just chalked it up to it being early on a Sunday. Anyway, I get back to the campsite, and everyone is obviously very upset. I asked why, and apparently everyone was freaked out because of me. I apparently had not returned when I was supposed to, and they had even supposedly gone down the trail looking for me. When they couldn't find me on the trail, they said they had decided to wait at camp for me to come back, but if I hadn't come back in an hour or so, they were going to report it to the park ranger. I found out it was early afternoon. Everyone was super pissed at me because I had stuck to the plan I told my tentmate. No one ever believed my story that I had hiked to the place I said and back. Everyone for years after was still convinced I was playing a joke on everyone and hiding or trying to be funny and denying it. It's entirely possible I could have spent more time on the trial than I thought and just gotten mixed up. But what I still can't get my mind around are two things. How could I have possibly spent that much time hiking three miles? I definitely didn't linger or stop anywhere. And I 100% stayed on the trails. It was really a pretty disappointing trail, so there wasn't really anything to look at that would have made me slow down or get off it. The trails were very well maintained, with blazes and signs. There is no way you could step off that trail and not know it. And also, I was an athlete, so I was in really prime physical shape. The other thing that's bizarre is how no one could have passed me while searching on the trail for me. I've never resolved this in my mind. To this day, I have never put the pieces together. And I don't think anyone else ever accepted my version of events. Back in 2008, I was a student planning to go to university and needed some extracurricular stuff I could put on my entry-level applications. As most UK students know, 
one of the best to have on hand is the Duke of Edinburgh Award. As part of this award, you have to embark on an orienteering expedition, basically a long trek through woodland and rural villages following nothing but a map and compass, no GPS is allowed. It's a teamwork experience, and you camp and overcome hurdles together, etc. Anyway, I was out of shape at the time, and so my uncle volunteered to take me out to the middle of nowhere to get some idea of what orientation was like. We didn't stay out overnight like I would have to during the real thing, but we hiked maybe 10 miles through woods and a small village in pretty abysmal weather. By the end of the journey, we were soaked to the bone and pretty miserable, looking forward to getting back to the car and heading home. For the last part of the journey, we were on a dirt trail heading uphill with bushes and trees on either side. We were marching onward in silence at this point when, all of a sudden, there was a rustling in the foliage to our left. From behind a large bush stepped an old man in a black suit with a red bow tie and dress shoes. He looked late 70s or early 80s, very pale, with liver spots dotting his face and a grey or white comb over. I was instantly weirded out. Who dresses like that to go into the woods? The instant thought seeing a guy his age out there in those clothes and those weather conditions was, this guy has lost his marbles. There was something else that took me an extra moment to notice, though, that puzzled me, the guy was bone dry and didn't even have mud on his shoes. We stopped in our tracks and just stared at the man for a moment, who appeared to be frozen and shocked at seeing us. My uncle made the first move, taking a step towards him and asking him if he was alright. The old man continued to stare for a moment, not moving even a twitch, then became suddenly very animated. It was like he suddenly snapped out of a trance. He started flailing his arms wildly, saying something awful had happened, that a good friend of his needed help. He began walking backwards into the woods, motioning for us to follow him, which we did. We started off at a brisk walk, then escalated to running as we struggled to keep up with the old man. After maybe a minute, he disappeared ahead of us, but we could hear him, so we continued to follow the noise until we reached a huge slope. We stopped at the edge and looked down to see the old man standing at the bottom motioning for us and pleading with us to follow him. I remember looking down, and the slope was probably at a 40 degree angle, spanned for perhaps 50 feet or more, and slick with mud. It looked like an accident waiting to happen, especially given there were no shrubs or roots to hold onto or anything. I remember looking down at the old man on the other side of the slope and wondering, how the heck did he cross that so quickly and so cleanly? I mean, at that distance, it is hard to see fine detail clearly, but I swear he still did not appear to be wet or muddy at all. Me and my uncle looked at each other, and I saw that he was getting as weirded out as I was. Despite my feelings, I made a step toward the edge and was going to try and make my way down when my uncle grabbed me firmly by the arm and pulled me back. Under his breath, he said to me, something's wrong here. We took a few steps back from the edge at this point, and the old man at the bottom started getting irate. He began pleading with us again to come down the slope, telling us he needed our help, his friend was in trouble. My uncle shouted down to the old man that we would head back to our car and call emergency services for him, and that professional help would be on its way soon. They would have all the tools to help him, etc. The old man suddenly got furious, he began jumping up and down, demanding that we come down the slope right now or there would be hell to pay. His voice had changed drastically, he was practically growling his words, his hands bunched up into fists, pounding his knees like an angry toddler throwing a tantrum. I've never seen a grown adult fly into such a rage in my life. His eyes looked like they were on the verge of bursting out of their sockets, and his skin went from pale to red in almost an instant. We began to hurriedly make our way back the way we came, his demands and threats getting less audible as we got closer to the trail. Once on the trail, we practically power marched the remaining quarter mile or so to the car, all the while my uncle was on the phone to the emergency services, explaining to them that there was a possible mentally ill old man wandering the trail. We were ordered to get to our car and await the police so we could show them where we had encountered him. About an hour later, we met four officers, two of whom had dogs with them and packs of supplies like first aid, emergency blankets, etc. We led them to the exact spot and then pointed the two officers with dogs in the direction he led us through the bushes. The search lasted all weekend, but there was no trace of the old man. The officers said the only trail they could pick up had been mine and my uncle's. They didn't find any footprints or anything belonging to the old man we encountered. One of my weirdest experiences to date. In early April of 1978, members of my extended family took a trip to the Sequoia National Forest, near the confluence of the Kern River and Brush Creek Flats. The party consisted of my grandparents, parents, uncle-slash-aunt, cousins, and my siblings. I was about eight when this happened. In any case, about noon one afternoon, my aunt laid my cousin, age almost three, down in a tent for a nap. 
our grandparents were in a trailer just above the tent, and the camping spot was hemmed in by the river and creek on the other sides. To reach the creek, you could take a small path over the side of a steep embankment, and the river was a similarly steep trail. It was a warm day. My cousins, siblings, and I were eager to go back down to the creek, and our parents went down to watch us. To be fair, I don't know why my aunt thought it was okay to leave a toddler in a tent alone. But my grandparents were in line of sight and never left their camping area. They looked in on Katie around 1, and she was still asleep. Around 2, my aunt realized that Katie had been asleep for 2 hours and wanted to wake her so she'd go to sleep at bedtime. So, she went up the hill. 5 minutes later, all hell broke loose. My aunt reached the tent to find Katie, not in her sleeping bag, but in the tent. She assumed she was with our grandparents in the trailer and went up to look in on her. My grandfather was sitting outside, and my aunt said, Hey! Is Katie inside with mom? My grandfather said, No. She's in the tent sleeping. Of course, that sent my aunt into a panic because Katie wasn't in the tent. Everyone started looking for Katie. I remember, very specifically, my uncle running to the pit toilets because he feared that Katie tried using them by herself and fell in. My parents were scared. Katie tried looking for us, toddled over to look down at the river, and fell. Either way, no one was anticipating a great outcome. We kids were asked to walk up the creek to the easiest spot to go down and see if she was anywhere in the creek bed. She wasn't. After checking everywhere within walking distance, my cousin flagged down a passing logging truck with a radio to call the authorities, and my other uncle drove down to a little store to make a call to the police. Meanwhile, everyone who was an adult, save my grand Moore, who was left with us in the trailer, fanned out to look. The logging trucker radioed up to their crew base, which was near Johnsondale, and asked everyone to be on the lookout for a child. They were upriver and had trucks coming down almost every half hour. No one saw Katie. There was no real sign that she'd been anywhere. When she was laid down to sleep, my aunt had left her in shorts, a tank top, and white leather sandals with a buckle. By the time anyone official arrived, it was 4 p.m. and hot. Like 100 plus hot. I can't remember the exact sequence of events of the afternoon, but at one point, the assumption was that Katie had likely gone down to the creek, fell, and was pushed into the main current. Some fishermen had been cutting their way downstream and hadn't seen anything, and no one in the campground downriver saw anything, and the river got shallow in some places, shallow enough to hang up on rocks and branches. But it was like she had just disappeared. One thing everyone noted was that Katie was not the sort of kid to walk on the road by herself. She also hated the noise that Jake Brakes made on a logging truck, and we were all pretty confident she wouldn't have left camp. It just wasn't in her nature. We half expected to find her playing with her sand toys in the dirt somewhere under a tree. Around 9, a dog handler arrived, and they used the scent on her blanket to track her, but the scent just stopped dead down by the river. Oddly, the scent didn't follow a trail, it went through bushes and brambles and some rocky, hot terrain and just disappeared at the edge of the river above Brush Creek's inlet. That just about killed my aunt. So, at this point, it was just the assumption that she was in the water. It was a complete feeling of hopelessness. They had decided to see about getting a SAR team, specifically one trained in swift water, but those just weren't a thing back then. But it was decided that the crew they could get would start heading up the canyon or over from another county. About 5 o'clock in the morning, a crew arrived, and they started to formulate a game plan. Meanwhile, some forestry guys were walking the road looking for any sign, and they found a sign above where the dog indicated she went in the river, about 20 feet above, just off the side of the road. Odd. That refocused the search. Maybe the dog tracked an earlier trail, or maybe it had just been wrong, we thought. About a mile upriver, there's a really, really tall bridge. A fisherman had taken a game trail down and wound up on the opposite side of the river, and he saw a small white tank top in tatters. It was covered in those little, wheat-looking brambles and torn. It was so beat to SHT that he didn't even pick it up. But, on his way back up to his vehicle around 8 a.m., he was stopped by a game warden and questioned, as many people were. He told the warden he'd found a tank top, and they went back down to retrieve it. It was Katie's. Simultaneously, a hiker recalled hearing what he took for giggling and a child's voice hours earlier, in the dark, near the bridge. All of these men had solid alibis for the night before. Just about the same time, the radio crackled, and to everyone's astonishment, my cousin was found, like, five miles up the road, across a very slippery creek, just above a huge waterfall. She was totally nude, a car coming down from another campground saw her just standing there in a daze. She wasn't upset, she was just dazed. Not cold not sunburned. Not hurt in any way. Her feet and legs were a little scratched up, but the bottoms of her feet were perfect. 
To this day, I have no earthly idea how she survived what she is alleged to have survived. A toddler allegedly cut through brush, crossed a river, gained about 2,000 feet of elevation, and walked five miles in the blistering sun. She survived a night outside with no clothes on. No blisters on her feet from walking on hot granite? She didn't stumble or fall. The easiest assumption that everyone was quick to make was that she'd been abducted, but by whom and how? And deposited where she was found. But why were her tank top and sandal found where and in the condition they were? It makes no sense. Where were the rest of her clothes? They wrote off her day's state as dehydration and exposure, but when they were asking her what happened, she didn't talk about being taken or held against her will. She talked about following a bear man. None of it adds up, and to this day, it's a family mystery. I wanted to share something that happened to me and my girlfriend two years ago. We were both in our late 20s. Thinking about it still makes my skin crawl and my heart pound. Sorry if it's a bit long, I want to set the scene appropriately. We camped for the night in the Stanislaus National Forest near Big Trees, California. We were only about 15 minutes off the main road, but in a pretty remote area, basically, dirt roads and nothing but trees in all directions. We arrived in the early afternoon and set up camp in a nice clearing at the top of a hill beside the road. We drank some beer while we cooked dinner. We saw maybe four cars go by in the hours between when we arrived and nightfall, all hunters leaving the forest. By 7 o'clock, the sun had mostly set and it was getting dark. The solitude and peacefulness of the woods were nice, but it felt just a little odd being so secluded. I've been camping probably 50 times, but I have always been with a larger group or at a dedicated campsite. After dinner, when it was dark, we hung a bear bag with all of our foodstuffs and smoked a joint, laying back on a blanket and looking up at the stars. I was feeling good and pretty much forgot about the fact that we were alone in the middle of the forest. We got into the tent and sat in the darkness and talked for at least an hour, I'm a tall guy, but my two-man tent is high enough that I can sit up inside of it without a problem. The rain fly was laying on top of the tent, kind of flung over the top but not attached or staked down, fully covering one side and draped over so that the other side was mostly unobstructed. We had a clear view out of the mesh siding, and the trees were barely illuminated by the moon in front of us. Here's where it got spooky, I had been doing a lot of browsing on the internet and decided to tell my girlfriend. Basically, a sub is dedicated to this spooky ritual where you sit in a darkened room at 3 a.m. and set up a candle and two mirrors, and through some combination of supernatural forces and sleep deprivation, images appear in the mirrors and speak to you. I was having fun scaring her, and, to be honest, I was scaring myself a little. Ugh, my hair is standing on end as I recall this. The woods were dead silent, and there was absolutely no wind. Nothing rustling, no air moving at all. It would have been very easy to feel even the slightest breeze while sitting like we were. I paused in my story, and as I did, the rain fly started to ever so slowly draw back from the top of the tent. It didn't fall off, it wasn't blown. To be honest with God, it was as if someone was carefully pulling it down from behind us. I will never forget the sound it made. We turned and stared at each other wide-eyed, and my heart was in my throat. The fly continued to slide ever so slowly down the tent until it was completely off. It was too dark to see clearly behind us, but my mind conjured all the nightmarish beings I've ever seen in horror movies. I'd like to say I sprang into action and ensured our safety, but I was literally frozen. What a feeling. We sat in stunned silence for maybe 10 seconds until I finally found it in myself to grab my flashlight and look behind us. There was nothing there. We breathed a huge sigh and started whispering feverishly, what the duck? Did you? I got out and looked all around the clearing, but I felt stupid after a while, and we went to sleep. The next morning, we woke up early and packed up camp. It was sunny and quiet, and I was happy to be in the woods, but I couldn't shake the eerie feeling from the night before. I was on my knees, roiling up the tent, but kept glancing through the trees around us kind of compulsively, and my girlfriend was packing up breakfast about 30 feet in front of me. Again, there was absolutely nobody around, and there were no birds chirping or animals in sight. Then, I heard from directly behind me two quick thwacks. Thock. Thock. Loud, and about two seconds apart. Like the sound of an axe hitting a tree. I judged the source of the sound to be within 100 feet of me. My girlfriend sprang up as I wheeled around to look behind me, but there was nothing there. We both said it was time to get out of here and left in a hurry. My heart didn't stop pounding until we were back on the main road. I have never been so thoroughly spooked for such an extended period of time in my life. When I was 16, I became a CIT, counselor in training, at my summer camp. I had been going here since I was 13, and now that I'm 16, I am a CIT. Being almost a counselor, 
you get to stay up later and see what the counselors do after hours. During the first night, we bonded fine after the kids went to sleep. The new owner of the camp rode up on his bike in front of the camp to the back boys area, where the oldest boys camped. He asked how the first night went and then asked the group of us, but directed the question towards us, who have been here for years and aren't new. He asked if we had ever heard about the archery range being haunted. We all said yes when asked specifics, and we all mentioned that it sort of draws you in. My experience was that I was walking from the dining hall to the back boys cabin for the night, and you had to pad the archery range to get there. Not through the archery range, just past it on a trail. There is a main trail that takes you everywhere, everyone uses it, it's the main road. Back boys is just furthest from the entrance of the camp, not secluded, and the bathrooms are just after the archery range that all back boys cabins use. As I'm walking past, I see a bright light glow in the middle of the archery range. It says nothing, but I can't help walking towards it. As I get closer, I start to feel more calm. It's not scary, you just feel relaxed and comforted. Once I get close enough towards the center of the archery range, it disappears, and I continue my walk back to back, where the rest of the counselors are sitting by a fire. I ask if they know anything about a light in the archery range, and they all say, yes, don't approach it, just keep walking, it comes and goes. My godfather has a cabin that sits in the middle of the new forest, Bournemouth. I decided to visit there for a few weeks with my Malamute. My godfather was out of the country and said all was well, and I packed, arrived, and was getting ready to spend the night there. I decided to take some photos of the wild ponies and pigs there to show my mom that I had gotten there safely. I put Sky on her lead, and we went off for a hike. I know we left the cabin around 11 am, as I was on a video call with my boyfriend before leaving, and as it ended, the time came up. So I'm taking photos of wild horses, and I hear hey, come here, seemingly to come to the right of me. I look, and that part of the forest is deeper, and I couldn't see anything standing or hiding that way. Sky, on the other hand, heard it and jerked that way on the lead. Come closer. This way, I focused myself now on looking through the trees and long grass, and there was now a simple stone path that weirdly didn't have any grass or growth around it. You could clearly see a cobbled path. So, Sky and I started making our way down that path. I didn't notice at the time, but I could clearly hear the sky whimpering and nothing else. It was like all other sounds were muted. I know I'm not making any sense typing this out, and I'm sorry. It was like everything else around me, the birds, the wind, and the trees, was just fading away, and I was in some weird sort of haze. Just a bit further, a woman's voice, seemingly coming out of nowhere, whispered to us while giggling. Sky shook me out of my trance by stopping, putting her hackles up, and growling at something. I shook my head, and suddenly the haze and confusion had disappeared. We were still on the path, but I had a very weird sense of dread starting to creep over me. That and the sky growling just made me think nope and we ran back to the clearing we came from. Come back. A woman screamed at us, and it seemed to follow an echo around us as we were both running back. We made it to the clearing and back to the cabin. I double locked all the doors and pulled the curtains and blinds over the windows due to the fact that I thought we were being followed and whatever or whoever wanted us down that path so badly would come back for us. They never did. I checked my phone right away, as I now had service and was connected to the Wi-Fi. Multiple calls, texts, and WhatsApp messages all came through at once. There were a lot of questions about where we were, whether we arrived safely, and why my boyfriend hadn't heard back from me. We were in the woods for what seemed like an hour and mere seconds on that path. It was now 9pm, and I have no recollection of the missing time we had encountered. My husband and I were just discussing this again because it's a total WTF experience that makes me throw up my hands when I talk about it, but it's led me to all sorts of internet deep dives periodically. Three years ago, we hiked the TCT with a friend. One night we were nestled in a super cool spot on Death Canyon shelf, our backs to a sheer face of rock. A raging thunderstorm came through as we were sleeping, and I've never heard such loud sounds reverberating off of the cliffs. Terrifying, awe-inspiring. Anyways. I'm a light sleeper, so I was awake a lot of the night. It was pouring ice cold rain that turned into sleet that blanketed our tent and camp. Around 3.30 in the morning, when I was lying there completely awake, I heard what sounded like a woman's voice. It sounded enough in the distance that it wasn't as if she were in our camp, but close enough that I could clearly catch that she was singing a melody. It was a completely haunting song that sounded like morning, like an old folk song in another language. I told my husband and friend the next morning that it sounded like sad yodeling, Ridiculous, I know, but it was very throaty. Beautiful and haunting. It was 3.30 in the morning during a raging thunder and sleet storm. If, 
By some chance, some poor soul even happened to be hiking past, they would not have been singing. Pounding sleet, rain, and very close together peals of thunder and lightning. But we were so far away from the trail that that couldn't be. There were no sights occupied near us. Honestly, it stuck with me. I was Jungle Perch, JP, fishing at the Black Rock Waterfalls in Mowbray, far north Queensland. To get to the waterfalls, you have to walk up the creek that eventually leads to the waterfalls. The walk is about 3 kilometers long. There is no set path to take, so you find yourself walking up on both creek sides or in the actual creek itself. Plenty of rock was hopping and waving through water that was chest deep. Going up was immaculate. I caught lots of fish and recharged myself from the stress of life. It was raining, and there was no one else for the whole day in the area apart from one family that passed me because I took my time fishing each deeper pool for JP. The family had already made their way to the top, then left when I was still making my way up. So I was truly alone then. Once I had gotten to Themane Waterfall, I took a bit of a rest and relaxed there. All was well until I started getting an unnerving feeling that something or someone was watching me. I mostly brush this off because you do tend to get these types of feelings from being alone in the bush. After my rest, I started making my way down the creek. However, the feeling did not leave. It wasn't overwhelmingly strong, so I kept on brushing it off. I decided that I would only fish the main pools that I had some luck in on the way up. Also, you don't catch as many JP downstream due to them mostly looking upstream for prey. After walking about 300 meters from Themane waterfall, I wasn't getting much luck, so I sat down on a flat spot and changed the lure on my rod. This is when it started to get very strange. As soon as I stood up, I had this unearthly smell fill my nostrils. It's something you can't describe, personally, it felt more like an experience than a direct smell of something, if that makes sense. If I were to compare it to a smell, it would be similar to really bad smelling sweat mixed with rotting flesh or fruit and wet car carpet or dog. After half a second of smelling this, I instantly went into this very confused trance. I didn't know where I was, briefly, and felt very confused and lightheaded. I would say this lasted for around 4-5 to five seconds, but it could have been longer as I didn't really have a sense of time during it. I remembered snapping out of the trance I was in while looking at my rod. The moment I snapped out of it, I felt all the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. Some people say this as a play on words or expression, but this feeling was different. My upper back and neck went extremely tingly, and I could literally feel my neck hairs stand up. This was paired with the most intense get the duck out of there feeling I have ever experienced. It wasn't just an instinctive, horrible feeling, it was pure doom, like all the fear in the world was projected onto me in one single shot. I knew instantly that whatever I did did not want me there, and I knew that in my whole being, I was so convinced something was there that I verbally apologized for being there and said I was leaving. The trouble was, it was 2.7 kilometers back to my car, and moving downstream is a lot harder than upstream, so it was a very long, painful, and paranoid walk back. The whole way, it felt like someone or something was following or watching me. I thought I heard a scream or sound on two occasions, but it was so hard to tell with the loud gushing water. With each step I took away from the initial spot where the experience happened, that feeling would subside. I was about three quarters of the way back to the car, and I gained enough courage and curiosity to see if I could maybe communicate with whatever it was or at least catch a glimpse of what was there. I stopped, turned around, and was about to walk back upstream, literally about to take my first step, when the feeling of intense doom punched me in the face again but with only about a quarter of the strength from the first time. It was like it was warning me again not to come back. With that, I accepted my fate and made my way back to the car, still shaken from what just happened. As I was walking on the off-road track back to the car, the owner of the nearby property was near the entrance and was about to mow his lawn. I stopped for a chat and asked him if he had had any weird experiences around the area. He looked at me with a cheeky smile and blatantly said, I wasn't the only one that has had an experience like that here. He said that around five times a year he will be stopped by a shaken tourist or local that has just soiled their jocks. He said around the same time last year, a couple had a very similar experience to mine. He seems to think it's around the wet season when there aren't many people on the track. He mentioned that at night he had heard what he thought was pig screaming around his yard, he said it didn't sound like a pig, but that's what he logically thought, and then as he went to check for any crop or ground destruction from them in the morning, there was nothing. He also had moments when the curlews would be going off their nutters, screaming, then all the birds would fly away from the trees, then just eerie silence. He also mentioned there have been many Yowie, Australian Bigfoot, sightings around that area. I found out later from an Aboriginal elder living in the Mowbray area that that was sacred land to the Aboriginal people, and men were not meant to go there as it was a birthing place for women. After my experience, 
I had to sit in my car and collect my thoughts on what just happened, away from the area, of course. Thinking about going back with a mate in the near future. About three years ago, I was 23 at the time, I got this really nice tent for my birthday. After a couple of weeks of trying to get my friends together for a stealth campout, I decided to go ahead and try out the tent in my backyard, 13.6 acres. I got in my tent around 10.30, and I fell asleep around 12.15. The coyotes woke me up sometime during the night, but after they stopped, I started trying to fall back asleep. As I was lying there, I heard what sounded like deep breathing right outside my tent. At the time, I thought nothing of it. I figured some animals got curious and wandered over. I picked up my phone and started texting my friend Mark. The time was around 4 a.m. after about 10 minutes, the breathing didn't stop, so I got up to peek through the mesh part of my tent. When I didn't see anything, I got back onto my sleeping pad and fell back asleep. I woke up not an hour later with my breath right on top of me. It was really heavy. I started to record on my phone, but it was too quiet to hear over the bugs and birds. I didn't fall asleep that morning. I packed up and headed back inside around 6. I am and always have been a skeptic. I believe this event to be paranormal due to the lack of explanation that says otherwise. I continue to camp on my property to this day. I have never really thought too much about it until recently, when I visited my family. My sister explained that she had a similar experience while driving. The first event happened in late August of 2016, while we were running late one night. We both ran cross country and track in high school and still do so to this day. My friend worked a job that wouldn't get out sometimes until 10 or 11 at night, so we would typically go running very late at night. This had been happening for a couple of years at that point, so we knew our path very well. On the local running path, down 2.5 blocks, into the woods that butts up against a large creek, at some points on the path in the woods, you can see houses and a park, but other times it starts to get a bit more secluded. We aren't talking about the wilderness here, though. There is wildlife in the area, mostly raccoons, skunks, too many close calls there, a random beaver, and the occasional deer. Over the years, we have seen more and more coyotes around the streets, but never in the woods. Given our location, there isn't a local bear or wolf population, this is a critical detail to the story. We met to go running one night around 11.15 or 11.30. I am not entirely sure of the exact time, but it was fairly late, and thunderstorms were on the way, according to the weather app. For this reason, both of us left our phones in the car, the one time we had and we've regretted it ever since, and decided to run pretty fast to make it back before the storm. In the woods, it is mostly a wood chip trail until it gets to 200 meters from our turnaround spot, a water pumping station as the town has had flood problems recently, where it turns to asphalt. We run to the turnaround spot and start running back. As this was about a quarter of a mile from the wood chips to the turnaround and back, I would estimate it took around two or three minutes, given a slight stop at our turnaround. On our way back, we noticed what we can only describe to this day as an upside-down trash can with a fuzzy or blue outline in the middle of the path right before it transitions into wood chips. If I had to guess, I would say about 3 to 4 feet tall, perhaps on the shorter side. Again, I need to stress that this was only 2 or 3 minutes after we had our first run by and came back to that exact spot. This thing had appeared there in that short time period. We stopped running, as this was rather peculiar and not there when we ran by at first, but continued walking closer. We thought maybe someone moved something in front of us as a prank, as the only people that frequented the woods other than us at that time were teenagers smoking or drinking, but they were loud and could be heard from very far away. This thing was dead silent, and we continued to get closer until we were about 50 feet away and it started to move. When I say move, it was standing still, but as if it were swaying part of its body completely left, and then completely right. We had seen a red glare on either side when it turned its head, like the lit end of a cigarette when someone inhales, not a very bright glow, but enough to be seen in the pitch black as there are no lights in that area. Talking between us, we began to become very uneasy, as this was unlike any person or animal behavior we had ever seen. This thing made no sound, and we were worried it was some dangerous animal, so we started backing up slowly and made a run for it, it did not follow us but stayed in place, moving in the same manner. We ran as fast as we could back to my car and drove over, arriving approximately 25 to 30 minutes later as the storm started to come in no rain, just lightning. Looking around, we found no trace of it whatsoever, no broken branches in the woods, no footprints, nothing that would lead you to believe a large creature in the woods visited us. Neither of us could explain it, and after failing to find an observation, we tucked it away. Fast forward to the end of December of that year. We were on another run, one of our first at night since the incident, and when we got to the pumping station, 
we had found a disturbing sight. We discovered what appeared to be a dead deer leg lodged in the chain link fence, pretty much completely picked clean, with the exception of some skin and hair and the hooves at the bottom. The whole thing was pretty intact, from thigh to hoof. Shortly afterwards, I decided to bring a different friend to these woods who has the ability to see spirits, I have mentioned him on this board here before, that is a whole other story, to see if he could discover anything. As we walked by the spot where we saw the trash can, he was startled and focused towards the woods. I asked him what he saw, and without me telling him any other information prior to our arrival besides having some sort of experience here, he described a cloaked figure around the same height as what I saw, with beady red eyes staring us down. He said that once it noticed that he could see it, it ran away quickly into the woods. In the weeks afterwards, my running friend was back out on the trail, only to discover multiple other bones that we believed to be missing parts of the dead deer. He first discovered a spinal column with rib ends, just lying in the grass next to the pavement and the woods. He carefully moved it to be with the other deer leg to keep track of them all in one place. Three days later, in the same exact spot, he discovered what appeared to be neck vertebrae, and then a few days later, in the same exact spot, he discovered another bone, from which we do not know what part of the body it came from. At first, we were thinking of wild animals when we experienced this creature, but these other occurrences led us to believe something paranormal was happening in these woods. Does anyone have any explanation for what may be happening here? I cannot find an answer, and I am desperate for any information whatsoever. So I used to go fishing with my family in Jefferson, Texas, which is a small town near a very strange biome where pine forests and bayou cypress swamps coexist. I decided to take a spur of the moment trip because I found out a bit ago that the last remaining member of my family passed away, so as a sort of closure, I went there to take in the beautiful still wilderness and swamp nature. Right as it was getting dark, I heard this screaming. Like, what sounded exactly like an Aztec death whistle. Only it was coming from every direction around me. I first tried to rule out if it was a police or emergency siren, so I kept honing in on how it sounded. I was also trying to discern if it was maybe bobcats fighting or coyotes, but it sounded nothing like that at all. It grew louder and louder and then suddenly ceased. It sounded like he was trying to imitate what a police car sounded like, but he couldn't quite get there. Needless to say, I decided it was time to leave. I had this encounter about a year ago. I had decided to go on a solo hiking trip for about two weeks, this would have been my second time doing something like this. The first two days of the hike were very average and relaxing, just a simple hike, but at night things got a little bit weird. I went to sleep at around 9 or 10, and nothing much happened until around 2 o'clock. I remember smelling a faint stench of rotting meat. It wasn't anything too crazy, but it was weird enough to somewhat wake me up. I tried to ignore it and go back to sleep, but then I started to notice that something was moving around my tent. I did think that because of the smell and the sounds, it could be some carnivorous animal that maybe smelled of rotting meat for whatever reason. But since I was still half asleep, I wanted to make sure it wasn't a bear or something, so I opened my eyes to check around. Now, just to note that during that night, the moon was quite bright, so it was possible to see quite well outside, so when I opened my eyes, I could see a vague, lanky humanoid shadow outside my tent. I didn't feel like I was in danger or anything. I did have a sidearm with me, so even if it was some creep, I didn't really feel threatened while holding a gun. After about a minute, the guy left, and the smell also disappeared, but since it was a very creepy encounter, I stayed awake for about an hour, and after nothing else happened, I went back to bed. The next day I had that weird feeling of being watched by something dangerous, but I don't know if it was because I was confident in my ability to protect myself or whatever, but I didn't feel like I was in any danger at all, I just felt creeped out. I didn't really enjoy that day all that much, to be fully honest, and because of that, I set up camp a lot faster than I usually do, but I didn't go to bed at my normal time since I didn't want someone sneaking up on me again. At around 1 o'clock, I could smell that weird smell again, so I gripped my gun a little bit tighter and tried to find the guy but instead all I saw were just a pair of yellowish eyes in the distance. I stared at them for about 5 minutes, and then they just vanished with the smell. I didn't feel like I was being watched anymore during that night, so after an hour, I did decide to go to sleep. The next day, the feeling of being watched was back, but again, I didn't feel as though I was in any danger at all. But I decided that even though I felt that way, I would still rather cut this trip short than actually get into a situation where I was in danger, so I started making my way back, though through a more roundabout path. Nothing really happened that night. The next day I suddenly could smell that rotten stench, it wasn't any stronger than before, but since I was in a decently large clearing at that time and didn't see anyone or anything around me, I did panic a little bit and started walking at a faster pace. I'm not exactly sure how long I walked after that, but around midday, the stench got stronger. 
Now I think that it's important to note that I don't have the best vision and I should wear glasses, but I don't most of the time, so when I looked around me and saw a grey humanoid figure quite far away to my left, I panicked, but by the time I put my glasses on, it was gone. After that, I really didn't feel like staying there for much longer, so I started doing a slow run to get out of there faster. I had run quite a distance while feeling something following me, but then I ran into this strangely peaceful clearing where both the stench and the feeling of being watched stopped. It was a relatively small clearing with a few small boulders around, but the strange thing was that a man who was in his late 40s or maybe even early 50s was sitting on one of the boulders. He was wearing very plain dad clothes, definitely not something you would be wearing while hiking in the middle of nowhere, plus he had no gear anywhere near him, but the thing that I noticed first about that guy was his strangely bright green eyes. They weren't bright in the literal sense, but more like the kind of brightness you would see in the eyes of a child. After running for so long, I was exhausted, and the man noticed that and told me to sit down on one of the boulders and rest. I didn't even think about it and sat down. We talked for a while, mostly about hiking and nature, and while talking, he had this very friendly smile that made me feel at ease. When I had rested, he offered to help me build my campsite in the clearing. He was very good at starting a fire. We shared a cup of tea, and he told me that it was very nice talking to me, but he has to go now. He didn't really say why or where he had to go, but he just stood up and left. That night, I didn't hear any noises other than a few birds and crickets. When I woke up the next day, I felt very refreshed. I packed up and started to continue along the trail, I didn't feel like I was being watched or smelled that stench at all during the rest of my hike. My girlfriend at the time and I went up to Vermont to meet her parents, who were hiking or camping. We weren't the biggest campers, so we decided to just go up and spend the day in one night. We met them for lunch and then followed them to the camping area. It was pretty quiet, as fall had hit sooner and the nights were pretty cold. I remember not seeing a single soul through the woods, nor did we hear anyone else. After dinner and some acoustic songs, we went to our two tents and all turned in. At around 4 am, I woke up and had to pee. I am not afraid of the dark, but I was a little nervous to walk outside of the tent into the cold darkness and pee. There was a bathroom about one quarter mile up the road, but I didn't want to walk that far when all I had was a flashlight. So I went further enough from our camp that I wouldn't wake up my GF's parents with pee sounds, but not extremely far away from the camp. I finally finish and quickly walk back to camp. As I am about to go back into the tent, I hear a woman crying. Loud. I stop in my tracks and freak out inside. I don't think I've ever had that much fear strike me that fast. I almost couldn't move, but slowly backed out of the tent and just stared in the darkness. Whimper whimper. Loud crying. It didn't stop. Thinking back now, I should have woken Bob up and ventured out there together, but I didn't. I just stayed there and listened. Hello? I said it sternly. It stopped. Dead silence. I ran back to the tent, hopped in, and sat there. The silence was deafening. I guess I drifted back to sleep, but I don't remember it. I woke up again. It was light, and I heard people outside. It was my GF's parents. I went out and told them what I had heard, they looked spooked. I quickly shrugged it off, and we went on with our day. I told this story to my now wife, who has had some camping experience, and she told me that it could have been a fox. I researched the sounds of a fox, and it sounded nothing like what I heard. This was a woman crying. We were staying right in Bennington, Vermont, which I'm looking into right now. There have been some disappearances in the area since the early 1900s. My experience was quite a while back, in my youth, as a college student taking a two-week or so cross-country motorcycle or camping trip from Illinois to California in August of 1974 before the quarter started with my then-girlfriend. It was a small bike, a Honda 360. I was then a geology and geophysics student, and I was taking this as a prospecting or camping trip. I was exploring some of the abandoned gold-producing areas based on some U.S. geological survey publications as we drove to the West Coast, Colorado, Utah, Nevada, and California. We would visit an area, take a hike, prospect around, pull off down some remote road, maybe off-road a bit, and camp in a discreet and hidden location. We would take the bike off on various side roads or forest service roads and just pull off over a ridge, whatever, and just camp for the night. We were equipped with camping gear, food, water, and enough warm clothing for a cross-country motorcycle trip in the mountains. This was all pre-internet, maps, and GPS days, so we were pretty much dead reckoning navigation. In some areas, I might have USGS maps, but not here. It happened while we camped in a remote, unforested desert area just east of Pyramid Lake in Nevada, as we were crossing over from California just before we hit I-80 for our return to Illinois. We stopped just west of I-80, 
pulled off on a ranch or forest service road, found a hidden spot, and made camp. It was on the side of a vast hillside, in the valley, you could see a small slice of the ribbon of I-80 in the valley, and another vast hillside rose to the east on the other side of that valley floor. I would estimate we were 10 miles west of I-80. We pitched our tent and sterno cans to heat some dinner and coffee, sat around and looked at the vast sky, and watched the golden ribbon of the lights from I-80 in the valley. We bedded down for the night. At about 3 a.m., I was awakened with a freezing, bone-chilling cold. I was just frozen. In retrospect, I was probably anxious as well. I tried to awaken my companion, but she would not move. So I decided to light the sterno and maybe get some heat, on my hands at least. I grabbed the matches, tried many times, and the matches would not light up. Growing increasingly frustrated and thinking the matches were just damp from the usual early morning dew, I tore through my pack and found another book of matches. These would not light up either. In fact, as I studied the matches, they would ignite and just fizzle. These were the types of matchbooks that had the striker's sandpaper on the opposite side of the book as a safety feature. I kept trying and getting frustrated. It was then that the entire matchbook lit and burned my thumb, this was the opposite side from where I was trying to light the matches. I am sure I was talking and maybe yelling some expiative by this point, but this is also when I looked at my fingers and noticed a faint blue or blue-green glow coming from my fingers, which faded over the course of 3 or 5 seconds. I was mystified, but I thought perhaps it was the phosphor in the matches mixed with some moisture reacting with the sweat from my fingers and a little bit of sulfur. I remember telling myself at that time, yeah, sure. So I was still just freezing, I was mad, frustrated, and hurting from my burn. I was trying to get warm laying there, frustrated, and I just couldn't take it anymore. I jumped out of the sleeping bag and got out of the tent. I noticed the amazing star field above. I decided I would start my bike and warm up the exhaust pipe and head. The bike would not start. The starter turned it over at the usual crisp rate, but no pops at all. That is when frustration turned into analysis. I sat down on the hillside and found sanity in my scientific logic. I calmed down and wondered what was going on. I have never seen fingers glow or matches fizzle like that, how did the matchbook light up? I got peaceful and pondered, that is, when I felt what they call here the Oz moment, which I take to be the moment Dorothy leaves her black and white world and looks out through the technicolor doorway. I noticed everything around me, I could now hear, almost feel, the whine of the tires on I-80, I could almost hear the hum or energy of human activity in the valley below, I could feel the generators making the electricity that lit the small golden dots of light in the valley floor below. I would look up at the star field, which seemed unusually brilliantly crisp and three-dimensional, and I could almost hear or feel the quiet of the vastness of space. That is when I first noticed the creepy feeling that I was not alone, I felt the presence of something else. I looked around and saw nothing. I studied the feelings, and I could sense or discern the presence of four or five wispy blobby entities that were moving and flowing back and forth around the campsite, mostly behind me, to my side, just out of peripheral vision. My range for sensing them seemed to be about 20 to 30 yards. Once they would dart that far away, I would lose my sense of them. When I looked at where I perceived them, I sensed they would dart away quickly into the darkness and out of range. I never saw anything, I only felt them. I also noticed that when I perceived that they brushed along my side or back, I would then feel that bone-chilling cold sensation through my whole body. Once I figured this out, I got very peaceful. I was not afraid for my safety, maybe more my sanity, but my sanity was in studying this. I can say I felt that the entities were there because I was there, and they were darting around, almost playing with me, but definitely in relation to me, but were not there to do particular harm. Maybe that was not decided to do, just testing reactions or something. I prided myself on being a scientist and a logical thinker. I was also very mechanically inclined and had a lot of experience in mechanics, including some full engine overhauls. I concluded that this was a haunting, or a UFO experience, where the engine stopped running, which I had always heard about. I also wondered why engines do not fail when a mechanic is around. Well, here I am. I brought enough tools to do some mechanical work on the bike. Engine not starting, well, I have the stuff to diagnose the problem. I seized on this project as perhaps a way to focus on a task. I got up and took my toolbox off the bike. I tried to start it again, but no go. I went through the starting diagnosis steps. I took the plug out, hooked up the plug wire, grounded the plug on the block, turned it over, and got a bright, snappy spark, not electrical. So compression turned the engine over, and the cylinder sure blew a lot of air through the plug hole. Not having a compression tester, I put my thumb over the plug hole, a lot of compression. On the power stroke with the valves closed, it really sucked my thumb hard and held negative pressure when stopped, so the valves and rings are solid. Not compression. 
fuel sure smelled like gasoline coming from the plug hole, but to be sure, I took off the fuel line from the tank just short of the carb, turned the off valve on, and drained a little bit of gas into a little cup. I poured it directly into the cylinder through the plug hole, replaced the plug, turned it over, and there was no start, not even a pop. I waited 15 minutes in case the plug was grounded with gas and tried again. No start or even a pop. I went back and sat down on the hillside and just looked down the valley, feeling the blobby entities darting around in the periphery and sensing and hearing, or whatever the special awareness was. It was getting toward sunrise by this time. I felt that the sunrise would be salvation somehow. As the sun rose in the east, the sun was hidden by the mountain on the opposite side of the valley to the east. As the sun continued to rise, the sun would be shining above me on my hillside as the amount of eclipse sun by the mountain in the east was reducing. When the sunshine line approached my position on the hillside, all of a sudden the blobby entities left in unison, like wind, flowed downhill away from the sun and out of my range to sense them. I sensed they made a whooshing sound as they fled downhill. The world, or my perception of it, all returned immediately to normal. I got up, went over to the bike, and it started its first turn, as I fully expected at this point. I was no longer cold. When I discussed the night with my companion shortly after, she reported that she was awake the entire time all night, freezing, and was afraid I was possessed by the devil or something else, and she was deathly afraid to make a sound. She said she was paralyzed, I am sure I was talking to myself early in the event, and I was obviously acting strangely, but she reported thinking I was getting tools or knives to come back to get her. P.S. We did pack up right away, bugged out, and stayed in a hotel that night. My theory. I have come up with a theory to explain my experience and perhaps many of these types of encounters. There was no internet then, and I came back and got involved in my life and let it fade into memory, so I really had no opportunity to develop the theory further. But here it is. The inoperable or quitting internal combustion engines is a common report in haunting-like encounters and UFO encounters. In addition, I had these vivid feelings of hypersensory acuteness, hyper-awareness, the sensation of freezing, and the presence of others. Other of these encounters had feelings of paranoia, my girlfriend thought I was possessed and a danger, and she was paralyzed. She was terrified. Is it possible that there is some type of field, for lack of a better word, that dampens certain chemical activity and reactions within a range of space? As much as the effect would prevent the combustion of gasoline, the ignition of matches, or maybe the emission of photons leading to the photoluminescence of matches. Such a field could also affect certain chemical reactions in our brains, leading to a common thread of delusions and hallucinations, hyper-awareness and hypersensory feelings, and paranoia, which collectively would be considered the constellation of effects due to this dampening field on the brain. My bike engine failed to start for no apparent reason. It had to be some interference with a normal oxidation chemical reaction. I don't know how, why, or who would be controlling these fields, but they could be out there. Maybe they are just natural, a feature of the space we occupy in our orbit at that moment, or maybe they are concentrated by some mineralogy in the soil at certain locations. This is known as a lightning strike. This would lead to haunted mountains and haunted areas of legend. Maybe sunlight breaks up the field, or whatever it is, which is why many of these encounters happen at night. I would love to develop this theory further, but I have never had the time. I did come up with a sensor idea, something that would measure chemical reaction rates, but did not develop it further. What I experienced is real, I'm just not sure where it all came from. Maybe this field is controlled by aliens to disarm us, maybe it emanates from the spirit world, maybe it is a secondary effect of the temporal shift when in the vicinity of a connection to another dimension, or maybe it emanates from an alien craft. What I do know, in my theory, is that our observations, feelings, and beliefs from these encounters are not reliable since the sensors, our brains, are not operating correctly. We may have a sensor malfunction. But what I experienced was real, and something caused it.